uh, June 27th, uh, 2016 school committee meeting to order. Uh, before we start, we'll uh, do our reorganization. Sure. So, we'll thank you. That's the my uh, once my once a year around. task. Oh, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> In your, in your packet uh, is the policy on for the reorganization. So the first order of business is to um, accept nominations for a chair. So are there any nominations on the floor for a chair? Nominate Jean Borowski. <coughs> Second. Are there any other nominations for chair? Okay. So um, we need to do a roll call vote for this. All in favor of nominating Jean Borowski as chair of the Reading School Committee. Um, we'll do a roll call. Linda? So Gary? Yes. Yes. Julie? Yes. Jean? Yes. Chuck? Linda? And Lane? Yes. Okay. Jean, congratulations. Oh. <laughs> to be overly dramatic, but it, it really is an honor, and I'm humbled by it. So thank you. Um, <clears throat> I would like to open up the floor for nominations for the position of Vice Chair of the Reading School Committee. I'd like to nominate Chuck Robinson. Do I have a second? Second it. Any, uh, do I take other nominations or discussion? Uh, there are any other nominations. Any other nominations? I just would like to say that um, I want to really appreciate um, Chuck's leadership over the years. Um, and I think when he came to this board that was from FinCom, and that was like 20 years ago or something. Mm -hmm. And uh, he really yeah. has been a huge asset. And I really appreciate um, really the two of both of you and Jean, you stepping up to take the um, chair uh, in the coming year with all that's on our plate. And I think that the sort of having you guys as our leadership team um, as we go into this year is really important and I really appreciate both of, both of what you contribute and I think overall the board has a lot of, we have a really good mix of diversity um, and commitment and, uh, and a strong commitment but diversity amongst the views and, and strengths of the various members so I'm very excited about working with you also for the membership. Yeah and I, I'll add to that that um, I think Chuck is far too humble to ever toot his own horn, but you are really an unsung hero in the community. So I will second everything that Elaine said. Agreed. Thank you. Uh, I just, uh, I'm sorry. No. You know, I mean, this, this committee, uh, you know, with the collegiality and collaboration, uh, you know, makes it, uh, you know, very easy to not probably not the right word, but to, to do this uh, to be the chair, and you know, I appreciate that from everybody. Uh, uh, you know, as Mrs. Webb said, we have a lot of uh, diverse strengths and uh, but and diverse opinions on some things, but uh, you know, I really appreciate you know, you look around the state, and there's some committees where no work gets done. Uh, until 10 o'clock at night because, you know, of uh, bickering or whatever, and, and we, we don't experience that here. So I appreciate that. And I know uh, Jean will do an outstanding job. Big shoes to fill. <laughs> Thank you. Um, okay. Shall we move into public comment? Does anybody in um, the room want to make a comment um, that isn't on an item on the agenda? Okay, seeing none, we have a consent agenda tonight. Um, it includes um, field trips, some extremely generous donations, um, and some open session minutes from May 23rd and June 6th. So did anyone want to remove anything from the consent agenda? Okay. This is very strange. Are you ready to? <laughs> yeah, can I, I have a, yeah. can I ask, well, since I didn't pull one out, I just, could we get a, an update on, I know with, with everything that's been going on in the world, yeah. 
about some of the I look at some of these trips and we're, we're traveling abroad <coughs> Can you just give it an update on what we're doing to I know we use the State Department website or can you just mention that we, we do use the State Department website um, you know a lot of school districts are having similar conversations and school districts are basically all over the place on this issue I, I think our position has been and our feeling has been that um, it doesn't matter what field trip you go on whether it's abroad or if it's in the United States that as we know that there's always now some you know risk that that goes with it but we feel that you know the educational benefit of these trips is, is something that you can't um, you know you can't duplicate um, so the we have chaperones that, that you know, teachers that have been you know very supportive they that want to do these trips and um, you know I know I think pretty soon if not already we have a group that's going uh, to Poland um, that's leaving I think this week, week yeah. this week um, and so you know we you know we feel in the the um, teachers and the students and the parents feel that these are worthwhile trips to go on but we do monitor the safety we you know those are things that that we keep a close eye on thank you Sorry. And, and just a follow-up you obviously wouldn't hesitate to pull the plug on a trip if right. if information changed and it was suddenly wasn't right we would obviously Ms. Chair, uh, move to approve the consent agenda as presented. Is there a second? Second. Um, all those in favor? Good, six zero. Ms. Chair, I just wanted to say, um, I sort of was hidden in here, but I just wanted, not a problem, I just wanted to say that um, I appreciated reading the descriptions of the trips that as we had asked last year, there is the addition of the travel insurance as an option and there are some very thorough travel insurance options added so I thought that was helpful thank you um, should we move reports to the end sure yeah I think we should we have some folks here tonight to present um, on a very serious topic but hopefully some progress towards solving it so I'll turn it over to you dr. Doherty thank you so uh, tonight we have um, Erica McNamara, as you know, uh, Executive Director of the Reading Coalition Against Substance Abuse. Um, and she, along with, uh, uh, sorry, Lieutenant Abadi, <laughs> um, and uh, Tom Zaya are going to um, make some presentations around the, the changes that are going to be going on in the opioid law. And in your packet, there is a memorandum from, from um, my state association um, about a summary of the law and the different parts of the law and how it affects schools and then some other pieces of the law that indirectly affect, uh, affect schools. So um, the law, as you know, um, goes, is a, it has a broad scope to it um, and there are some different components. The first, first piece that is something that we're, we're already working on is driver's education, that there's going to be a module on the science related to addiction and addictive substances. So. Uh, Erica is working very closely with Sa Sandy Calandrella, who is our director of um, extended day and um, adult ed on, on that topic and how that's going to be incorporated for our driver's ed students. Um, and then the other pieces, which include a policy that you're going to see, um, it's actually changes in several policies. And MASC has provided some guidance on what policies need to be updated and changed. And so in July and August, you will see those updates that you will be uh, reading and doing your first reading and voting on. Um, the big piece that's going to affect us is the verbal screening tool and the concussion education piece. Um, and so that is what Erica is going to focus a lot tonight on is um, how we're going to approach that in the school district. Uh, Lynn Dunn also is going to play a key role of this. The, our director of nurses, Lynn, is on vacation and was unable to attend tonight. but. Um, I'm sure we'll be able to explain how that's going to work. For this year only, it's a pilot. It's not, um, it, we don't have to fully implement this. So we're taking this year as an opportunity to pilot the process that we want to use um, and, and to see, you know, what works and what doesn't work so that when we move forward fully with the process in the 2017-18 school year, we, we have it all, all smoothed out. Um, and with the concussion education piece, um, and Tom can speak to this. 
Um, there's going to be material that's going to be available that people are going to have to sign off. Parents will have to sign off that they have read the material with their, with their uh, child. Um, so I'm going to now turn it over to Erica, and she's going to go through the specifics. Okay. So um, as you know, in Reading, we've um, had a longstanding commitment to um, addressing the issue of opioid abuse. It was actually what inspired the formation of the Reading Coalition Against Substance Abuse. So to see this legislation come to fruition after a decade um, was very meaningful for those of us in the prevention realm and for folks on law enforcement to have um, legislators listening and incorporating that into um, something that's going to impact thousands um, of children and thousands of families. So I wanted to just play a short clip from the governor just to give you a sense of the legislation just to, so you know kind of what we're talking about, where it comes from. many things that inspires that level of emotion when people are crafting this type of legislation, but it's amazing to me how many people have been personally touched by the opioid epidemic. And in order for this to come to fruition, our state leaders and our legislators met with hundreds of families and heard heart-wrenching testimony um, about the development of the disease in their family and how folks were lost and where the system didn't catch people and where people fell through the cracks and where education opportunities were lost. And so we're learning from what has happened. Um, this is no small problem. This is a very complex issue that has affected um, us for many years in our community, so we don't expect um, any quick fixes. Um, but we are excited about the components that we'll be able to do with the new law. So as uh, Dr. Doherty said, um, the three kind of key pieces that we'll be helping um, the district develop along with the police department um, is that looking at the policies, um, we've been um, working with other districts as well to gather information on where everyone is in the process. Um, we'll be doing verbal screenings, and I'll talk about that in more detail, and then also the driver's education. Um, so we will be piloting the verbal screening program in the next school year. Um, you will get a, um, an opportunity to review the proposed policy changes this summer, and then as we go <coughs> through, more education um, pieces will be developed and in integrated um, along with Mr. Zaya. Uh, we had an opioid bill implementation committee that has been meeting um, some key folks in the district just working together, getting ahead of um, the actual mandate that's coming down next, uh, not this school year, but the next school year. So thank you to everyone. <coughs> 
Um, so, so far we've looked at um, what we've done in the past for verbal screenings. We did a program called Teen Screen a few years ago and we learned a lot from that process. There were a number of young people that were identified and re referred to mental health support. Um, we also learned a lot about protocol and how to manage it in-house. Um, we discussed the required screenings that we already do through the school's um, nurse's office and through health and wellness, which include vision, hearing, um, and scoliosis and height and weight, and talked about how could we make that a more fluid process along with this new verbal screen. We looked at best practices for screening. Um, the type of screening we're talking about has been coming down in the healthcare world for about 10 years, but has not been used in school settings for more than a few years. So we wanted to make sure we understood how things had been adapted for the school environment. And then also we participated in actual training around verbal screening programs, particularly um, Lynn Dunn, our director of school nurses, has attended a few trainings on this verbal screening process. And then we developed a, a verbal screening plan approach that I'll present to you tonight. So the verbal screening plan that we're proposing is the SBIRT approach. SBIRT is a recognized medical practice that has now been adapted for the school setting. Um, the idea is that you do a verbal screen with a short number of questions. It should be brief. It should be non-invasive. It's not diagnostic in nature. It is a screening. There should be, depending on how a child responds to certain questions, a short intervention that's educational in nature, and if warranted, a referral to further services. So I'm gonna walk you through what it looks like from a child's perspective, and I'll kind of talk you through the different options we have. As for it, it's an if-then approach. So depending on how I respond to the questions, the screener is gonna react differently. Um, and there's a protocol for every possible response. Um, the school expert process is supported by the Mass Department of Public Health, um, the, the State Elementary and, and Secondary Education Department, and then also Wilmington has been ahead of the game in implementing expert for the past two years, so they've provided us with their protocols and lessons learned, which has been really helpful. So how would a student experience expert? So basically, our nurse, um, which what we're proposing for the next school year is that we pilot at the high school, um, and it would be one grade. Um, and once parents are notified, they have the opportunity to opt out. So they would be given that opportunity to, to opt out if they <coughs> chose. But for students that are gonna participate, they would be given an, op, uh, an assignment to come to the nurse's office. They would go through their vision, hearing, screening, height, weight in, in the nurse's suite and then they will proceed to their SBIRT. So the idea is rather than just starting with, geez, let me ask you a bunch of questions about substance use, <laughs> there'd be a, a few minutes where they're spending time with the nurse, doing the other screenings, building up to the more personal questions. Um, and this is a, uh, an approach that not all the other districts are using, so we're, we're <coughs> piloting this. This may or may not work in terms of how it goes, but we're gonna give it a go. Um, so the nurse would do a brief explanation to the student about what the process is, they would direct them to the screening room, share specific handouts, and the handouts include the actual craft screening, which is a series of four questions, um, a brain scan photo, which is provided by the expert uh, trainers, which shows um, just a little bit about brain science and a little description that the nurse will describe to the child, and then also a helpline wall of cards for further resources. They begin the craft interview and basically just start with, I'm gonna ask you a few questions that I ask all of the students that I meet with, so this is not just because I think you might be using. I ask these questions to all of the students. And there is a confidentiality component. So in Massachusetts, there's some protected areas of adolescent health and substance use is one of those where a child can disclose information and it can be kept confidential until it rises to the level of needing treatment. And then that, that would warrant getting uh, more people involved. So the way the screening works is you start with four questions and they're very simple. They ask, you know, have you used in the past year? Have you ridden in a car with someone who's used? They're not super invasive, but they are, you know, designed to get at a little bit more information. They're prompting kind of questions. If they're no, the healthcare person reinforces the positive behavior and provide and reinforces the resources that are on the helpline wallet card, and that's it. If they respond in a certain way to those four questions, another six questions are asked, and that's where they may decide, are they at high risk or um, severe risk for use, then they would either do a brief intervention or a referral to treatment, depending on which response they would have. So what it provides is an opportunity to take a child through where we think they are. And it sounds a little bit choppy, but it's really not, it's much more fluid. It's a motivational interviewing process, so depending on how the child responds, 
you're prompting them for more information and moving through to kind of get a sense of where they're at. Any questions so far? Go ahead. Thanks. Sure. Um, thank you. Uh, what, so when they ask about, um, use, what are they asking about very specific drugs or are they asking, what are they asking about? Yes, they're asking about alcohol use, nicotine, um, use of any drugs. Yeah. Okay, so our whole gamut of really the YRBS. Yes. Yep. Um, yeah. And the, when the craft was originally introduced, there was only, I believe, alcohol. Um, it started off as an alcohol screening and it has been expanded, so the updated craft has all of the possible drugs, including synthetics. Two questions, actually. One is about um, you said one of the questions, the examples you gave was whether you've driven in a car. Are there questions that get at whether there might be a family member that they're concerned about? Mm -hmm. um, and that's yeah. that's one question. And then mm -hmm. the second question is you mentioned the confidentiality. How does that work if you go into the high risk or the brief intervention or the referral to treatment phase, if you've promised them confidentiality, how does that process work? What you are able to do is, is explain confidentiality in the context of the screening. And then you, it's the same type of confidentiality um, disclaimer we say to most students is, if, I, if I'm concerned that you're gonna harm yourself or someone else, then I'm gonna need to bring in another resource. And that's basically the same line. So when it comes to um, high risk use, as they're going through, Part of what you're, talk, you're talking to the young person about is, have you talked to your family about this? Does anyone know how bad it's gotten? You're kind of gathering information as you're going forward. Have you disclosed to your primary care physician? Who else is in the know about what's going on? And then you craft a plan to help bring the family in. It's not an easy process, but it's part of the process. It's the same thing we do with suicide risk and suicide screening, is we have to kind of help motivate the child to get to that next stage of bringing the parent in but you need to do it. But you, you're not, um, you're being honest with them the whole way through about what's happening and what's coming next. And another question is, so parents can opt out, mm -hmm. and in my imagination, I would imagine that sometimes parents uh, may be concerned, of, not that this would be the only reason they'd opt out, but if they had concerns about what the child might say, they might opt out protect a personal a family challenge mm -hmm. that's going on and so is there um, what's a life preserver or something some way to catch that <coughs> well I do know in Wilmington they said that they have not had too much trouble with letting parent have sh they basically tried to explain as much as possible what happens in the screen and the focus is on the child however at any point a child can disclose something about the family. This isn't designed necessarily to gather information about the family, but kids will always spontaneously volunteer things depending on what you're talking about. Um, so I don't see it as a huge barrier, um, but it is something that parents could choose just like anything else to opt out. So it is, it is one of those challenges. The way that the verbal screening works is there is an opt out option. To just follow up on that question and Gary's been waiting. Um, <laughs> Is, so, um, but if a student, not not in the context of this screening, yes, if a student came to someone, the school resource worker, yourself, Sarah Bird, Lynn Dunn, you know, someone, and you know, basically disclosed information that uh, portrayed a, a very high risk or severe use, where you guys are all like sort of there's a man, there's a mandatory reporter. Yes, and so as mandatory that. reporters, we know how to handle that, and and we've also been trained through youth mental health first aid how to handle those type of disclosures and how to assist a family. Um, and the goal always when a child discloses is what can we do to help the child? What's in the best interest of the child? So yes, there's a mandatory reporting component, but it's also about how do we connect the family to services, mm -hmm. or a lot of what we try to do first is get a sense of what's already in place where are we missing some of the supports that we could provide? Because usually with family substance use, there's already been some things that are already known mm -hmm. through other grades, through um, experience in other schools, or there might have been some counter interaction with the police department. So we try to look at the whole case and get a sense of what can we do to support the family. Mine was more procedural. So the consent process is gonna be similar to YBS, so if you pass a consent or informed consent. Yes. 
And that seems to be the approach that um, most of the districts have gone with. We haven't heard of, of anyone using the opposite. Mm -hmm. So that is the recommended practice. And there'll be some detailed information that parents can also click on. There's some videos that show how escort works, little short clips, so we think that could be helpful if parents are just looking for more information. There'll be opportunities to kind of get a better sense of it. And people may have already experienced this in their doctor's office. Some pediatricians are using escort. It's also done in, hot, in emergency rooms. So this may not be unfamiliar to some folks. They just may not know about how, what it's called. So how is someone? Oh, Mr. Robertson. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, um, not that I was going to ask. Um, well, essentially, <laughs> go ahead. Or Someone ask a question. Go ahead. <laughs> no, go ahead. Okay. Uh, Mr. It's being collegial. Uh, Erica, so you mentioned that we're starting this at the high school. Yes. Uh, do you, have you made a decision as to what level yet? or? or we're looking at ninth grade to start. Um, what we've heard is different schools have chosen different grades for different reasons, but when we looked at the screenings that already have to take place, it made the most sense to bundle screenings that are already happening in ninth grade. So we're starting there. That may no, not be what we end up recommending because, again, it's a pilot, but that's where we're going to start. In the future, we'll be doing two grades. Two grades will be required um, moving forward when we actually implement the law, two grades are required. So you, some <coughs> schools are already projecting or districts are projecting they may do one middle school grade, one high school grade, but it has to be a gr two grades within six to 12. Now we, we, uh, sorry, I, <laughs> we had um, the parent opt out option on, I, I can't remember, teen was screen. that the teen screen? Yes. yes. So do you have a, no, parent, teen screen was opt in, mm -hmm. which is a little different. Okay. So I'd be sorry to speak over you, but opt in is, works a little bit different, and, um, and Mr. Nyan probably knows a little bit more detail about the opt in process. But basically, um, you're not. It, opt out is everyone gets it unless you tell me otherwise. Opt in is you have to specifically sign your child up. So you tend to get a bigger response rate with opt out than so opt in. Does that make sense? <laughs> Why do we feel compelled to do that? Uh, do we have to do that, the, the opt, opt out? out? Yes. Okay. That's uh, part of the detail the in the, the legislation, yeah. Uh, just final comment on the, on the I just confused on the, the bottom part mm -hmm. there. Uh, so I understand that if, you know, they get an a answer that warrants other questions, what, but then it looks like from there you go to either high risk use or severe. What, what happens if when they get to that next level, whatever just didn't turn out to be anything? Right. Is there another path other than those two that they just you end it there? Or? It, it's a cyclical process, so you can go back to a, a previous piece to re-educate a child. You know, so sometimes a child might say, yes, I use um, a prescription medication every day, um, it's a tranquilizer, and as you're going along, you know, you may feel like I'm not getting the whole story, and then as you learn that that's what the child is prescribed. Maybe they're misusing something they already have, and that's an opportunity to re-educate them on how to use the medicine and to get in touch with the family and make sure that that's safe. So that might be one thing. Another thing might be a one-time use that was high risk. So some children get into trouble with alcohol poisoning, um, and it may have been a one-time event. They may not be an ongoing user. So high risk youth could be something like alcohol poisoning, they had a bad incident, um, but they're no longer using. And so that wouldn't necessarily warrant referral to treatment, it might warrant referral to counseling outpatient services to make sure that they're doing okay, but it may not warrant referral to detox, let's say, because they're not an active user and they wouldn't meet the criteria for a detox. <coughs> so that there's a lot of different things in terms of, it really gets down to severity of use, how much they're using, how frequent they're using, the combination of substances they're using and what supports they already have in place. So the, all of that is taken into consideration. It's not diagnostic in nature, so you're only gonna get so far in a screening and then you're gonna do the baton pass to the next credential <coughs> professional. Okay. And so we will have a plan in place to do the baton uh, passing to the person who would pick that up in the community. Thank you. Thank you. Um, how are the parents gonna be informed? Maybe I missed that. Is it gonna be through a letter? A letter. Yep. And then you mentioned something about videos, though. So we'll have a link that folks can click on that kind of shows you how escort works. 
Yeah. So we'll, I believe we'll send that out through email and then mm -hmm. I'm not sure if we'll do a, a printed letter to homes, but that yeah. will be up to the district, but we'll provide those, those resources that can be put up on our new Redeker site <laughs> moving forward. So will be, so email or hard copy? How will it go up? We haven't worked out those details yet. My guess it will probably be both. Both, yeah. yeah. Okay. Mr. Church, and if a parent asked, could you or would you provide them with, with these specific questions where they're going to be asked and screened? That would be part of the process. So the questions are publicly known, and that can be something they could just click on and view the questions. Um, the four questions are kind of part one, and then if they answered a certain way, there's an additional six questions. So it's just the one sheet that parents could view to see what the questions are. But all of them, the four and then the six, the would be available. Yep. Yeah. And it's a standardized tool, so we would use it as that tool. We wouldn't um, vary from it, but you know, different screeners might um, motivate in a different way. So, so John, uh, I had my question, I guess, for maybe for you. Uh, you know, in the context of everything we've been talking about and the, the, the topic of unfunded mandates always comes up, uh, where, does this fall within the grant or how are we paying for this? Well, we're, the primary strain on our staff will be uh, our uh, health department, our, nur our nurses. We'll, we'll be doing the, the, scre the screening piece um, the next piece is more outside resources that we're currently identifying. Um, in fact, we're going to set up a meeting shortly to, to figure out what that looks like. That would be most likely at the beginning funded through a grant, um, that piece. And that's the piece that's probably more intense in terms of time and services, but we're looking at a couple of different options, uh, which we're going to meet about shortly. But that, that would be paid for out of a grant for the first year or two. Mm -hmm. Then we're going to have to figure out where we go with that. But in terms of the, there is, there is some part of the legislature that talks about providing funding to, to make some of this happen. Thank you. And there is um, some grants that have, that we expect will come out for implementation of the verbal screen next year through the Department of Public Health. We just don't know yet when and how that will look. But we'll be ready. If I could just add one more piece. Of, part of the reason why we're <coughs> doing this with other screenings is we're trying to bundle it together to maximize the time instead of keep bringing kids down from different classes. And um, so that's why we're trying to do, that's why ninth grade, we're trying it with ninth grade because we do multiple screenings now in ninth grade. I, I guess in line with uh, Mr. Robinson's question, I was thinking, you know, at a minimum, you may have to double up some resources in the nursing staff yes. and bring in substitute nurses while you've got your trained nurses doing all the screening. So at a minimum, it would seem that you're going to have some increase there in the um, substitute resources required. And the plan so far for that is that Lynn would be the person conducting the verbal screen, Mary Ellen would cover the office component, um, so she, Mary Ellen will be assigned to screen, it will be Lynn, um, but as we look to adding in middle school or if we add in middle school that may become an issue because the high school is the only place that we have nurses. multiple nurses in one <coughs> location. So definitely moving forward, but that'll be part of the pilot process and the recommendations in terms of what our resources look like. Um, and also how long it takes. The screening itself can take five minutes, but depending on how a child answers questions, it could evolve into a much longer screen. So we also have to kind of see how it plays out with one grade um, and get some more feedback and figure out what we need for our nurses. So how, how would the bundling, you mentioned the bundling, how would that look? Is it gonna be continued like it, has in the past, one day it's uh, heights and weights, another day it's vision, another day it's hearing. No, when a student vision, comes down, the way we envision it, and again, we're, we're piloting this, yeah, so it may yeah. change. When a student comes down for a scoliosis screening or visioning or whatever, they, we would do a couple of the different screenings at that time, okay. rather than just that one screening. Yeah. And then the next day they come back and do another that screening. So we're trying those, to... Because those screenings that, that, that are being done, the scoliosis and the Exactly. Very fast, yeah. So the way that um, Lynn has talked about envisioning it is that we would assign kids to a certain time um, in a certain block, come down at 10, 10, this is your time, you're gonna come see the nurse. Um, we expect you'll be 10 to 15 minutes out of class. We're working with the health and wellness classes um, in terms of figuring out the logistics of that. But they would come down, um, they would be given the information, and then they would go to one room to do um, scoliosis, height, weight, 
and then they would be in a different room for screening. So the screening room would be more of a relaxed, um, sitting with a person one-on-one. -on -one. Um, and so we're thinking about this from the perspective of the student. What would be the most comfortable way to do this? Sounds good. Anything on the Title IV grants, John? For the we have not received any information on Title IV. Thank you. And I, I just want to make sure that we put enough staff resources on it so that we're not really impacting, we're doing the minimal impact to the students' time out of class and waiting time and stuff. It's, and it sounds like the processing you're describing um, sort of has two nurses pretty busy, which leaves you no capacity for any anyone who just needs to come to the nurse or has to come for a, a scheduled medication or whatever they do. So I just, again, this, the unfunded mandate thing, it, it, sound, it seems to me like it should have come with it really um, explicit funds, not just we're gonna put this grant together and you, you can apply for the grant. Yeah, and we, we do expect that, that resources will be coming down. We don't know what those look like, what they'll entail. In the meantime, what we've offered to the school district is for Julianne and I to be a resource to Lynn and be there on screening days, mm -hmm. and just to be a backup person that could be giving handouts, that could be helping a child through the process, not that we would perform the screens, but that we would just be other bodies in the office to help um, Lynn pr progress through as, as quickly as possible and keep Mary Ellen focused on the, the children who need health services. One more question, I would imagine that the grants would be non-discretionary, so more like if you apply and fill out the format the right way, you likely get the money. <laughs> yeah, we hope so. We know, well, I think it would have to be. So, let me take you through a few more I things. I actually have one on this sure. before we move on. Um, at what point are parents, if you go down that lower mm -hmm. one, at what point are parents brought in? After the screen is fully completed. Mm -hmm. So, if, if there is nothing that comes up on the screen that's concerning, parents don't hear anything because it is considered the screening itself, <coughs> that process is fine. If you get to that point where you're on a T looking at a referral to treatment, that's when you would bring in a family, but it's a process you work with the child on. So in that situation, we would be working with guidance, school psych, or a school social worker to <coughs> make a disclosure to the parent around, there's something on the screen that we're concerned about, we'd like you to follow up with primary care, here are the steps that we can assist you with, and here's what it looks like. We also are looking at bringing in another resource that I'll talk a little bit about that would be very helpful for the district to help manage the process of referrals. So yes, they would be brought in after the screen is fully done. Um, and then there'll also be a documentation process that's required for the state. Um, there will be non-identifying documentation and identifying documentation that will be tied to the child's health record, but there won't be any specifics around um, anything that anyone else could access, just like their current health records. But that's a completely privacy yeah, protection. Exactly. Yep. I'm so sorry to interrupt again, but the, so the timetable that you're talking about if you get to that brief intervention referral stage, will there be the next step there and then, or yes, will it be, uh, you know, we will get back to you? No, it's quick. It's quick. Because it's time sensitive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's time sensitive. And we do it all the time in terms of whether it's suicide risk or other mental health or co-occurring disorders. You know, if, if there's something that's rising to that level that we're concerned about, you know, we're looking at making sure that parents have information they can act on. And if parents don't have the capacity, we can also work with them to call in mobile crisis and have a team deployed to help manage that process. It really depends on what level of risk they're at, how much they're using, if they've tried to stop using on their own, they're at physical risk, risk of withdrawal. It kind of depends on what the circumstances are. Thank you. So some other things. So as far as an if, then approach, but there's a lot of other factors that go into this. So just looking at opioid abuse, although the screening is designed to help us with addressing opioid use. It's about all substance use. Um, but if you look at signs of heroin and prescription opioid abuse, there's a lot of other factors that we're looking at. We're looking at, is there weight loss? Is there um, you know, marks on the arms? Have they talked about using any needles? Um, do we see any paraphernalia that's with them? Have they got caught in school with something else? So we're looking at a much fuller picture than just the screening, but it is information that is helpful as part of a bigger picture. It can be helpful to help break the news to parents too, because often parents can be the last to know because this is a disease that's filled with a lot of shame. And people will cover it up for a long time for fear of disappointing the family. So this is not something that people want to hide, but it becomes something they must hide because they're so afraid of what the family's reaction is. So this is a process that we would help support the child in making that disclosure if that was happening. 
Um, so post-screening, there will be some documentation that's required and then we will have to, once things are implemented, we'll have to report up to the state the number of screenings that were done, I believe in the number of opt-outs. We're not quite sure yet, they haven't given us a report right. yet. Um, there will be scheduled follow-ups with students. So the idea of SBIRT is that for kids that have had, that went beyond the four questions at the beginning, they could be invited to come back in in a week for a follow-up. So depending on what, the way they answer on the other questions, um, there would be just like the nurse would follow up with a child who maybe popped on a scoliosis screen to make sure that they were referred to primary care. There will be a follow-up process where um, Lynn will be monitoring a certain number of students. Um, obviously determine if the parent phone call is needed and um, we would also be doing a team debriefing after every screening day to get a sense of where we need to go, what other resources we might need. There's um, some parent educational resources that Dr. Doherty mentioned that will be um, going through Mr. Zaya's office because the way that the law is written is that it'll be tied with the concussion training that is required for a uh, student athlete. So right now there is a website that is up with some specific links and there are a couple scenarios that are clickable that you can um, learn how to talk to your child about some of these issues. But we anticipate that they will be giving uh, something a little bit more comprehensive. In the meantime, we will be building other resources that we can provide to families. We'll be hosting some parent nights next year um, to kind of pilot some ideas um, to get information out to families. But this, we have not gotten a ton of direction yet from the state, and they're still a year out from full implementation. So that is all we know so far. So next I'm gonna kind of dive a little bit into some drug and paraphernalia awareness, just to keep on your radar how a lot of substance use behavior is polysubstance use behavior in the sense that young people use multiple substances. So the way that we ask the questions and screening is really important, and the way that we talk to young people, the language becomes very important. And Lieutenant Abadi is here as my law enforcement resource because some of the material you'll see came from um, cases that were um, worked by our detectives. So just to give you a sense of some of the new trends in the market, has anyone heard of earwax so far? I've mentioned this here and there over the years, but <coughs> it's actually hit the Northeast now, so we're seeing it more and more. <coughs> so it is a form of marijuana. It's butane hash oil. It's a distilled form, very potent form, that is known as earwax. It's a sticky substance. It also can be dried, and it's called shatter, um, which in, I don't know if you can see it really great, but in the corner, it kind of looks like glass. Um, at a recent conference that our law enforcement folks went to down in Rhode Island, they actually demonstrated how it is made, and it can be made um, through over-the-counter uh, materials. It's known as 710, so you may be familiar with the acronym 420, which refers to um, marijuana use. So 710 is the new term, um, because it is butane and hash oil upside down. So the problem with this is the potency and also the risk of um, getting ill from it because it is so potent. Um, this is a vape kit that was um, confiscated from a student. Um, the thing about vapes, you've heard a lot, I've been talking a lot about this to you guys, but one of the things that I wanted you to see from this one, and it's a little bit hard to see, but this package contains the battery, the atomizer, a dry herb vaporizer, um, a, a different type of atomizer component, a USB charger, a wall charger, a packing tool, and a brush. Pretty comprehensive little kit. So you can do a lot of different things with it. You can use it for dry herb, you can use it for wet earwax, you can use it for vaping liquid, which would be like nicotine use. So these products are really designed for a lot of different type of substance use. So I just wanted to point that out. The other thing that's interesting is, this is just a little screenshot from the website where you can buy the Vape USA kit. Um, there were over 1,200 different types of vapes on the Vape USA website. There's just enormous amount of product variation. Um, this is a more recent one that was confiscated from a student. This is called a PAX-2. These go for about $279. They're pretty expensive, but they're kind of the new wave of vapes. And they look kind of like... Um, thank you. <laughs> yeah, like the little uh, cheaters, right? So, um, but one of the things that's... They're designed for dry herb, so they're designed for marijuana. So remember how I've been talking about with vaping, it's one step closer to marijuana use. And what we're seeing is this new line of products is specifically for dry herb for marijuana. Yeah. These also come in um, 
gold with jewels, they can be engraved. There's a lot of different little fancy designs. So there's also a culture kind of around the types of, of vapes that people can gift or buy for one another. This is a shot from um, our evidence bay, um, and I'll let Lieutenant Abadi sure. explain a little bit more about this. So a little bit of this was, just, just to go back to the earwax too, one of the important things to know about that is you don't have to use a lot of it, so you can also mask it. It's about masking for the people that use it. You don't smell so much like marijuana when you're using it. It's a, it's a, it's a little bit harder to detect when you're using it. And that's kind of the trend with a lot of this you're gonna see here is a lot of the scented wraps they use and a couple of the other pictures. But this goes back to what Erica was talking about with the, the poly drug use too. You're gonna see, this is an entire kit out of one person. Uh, everything we're gonna show you has been seized or as part of a evidence trail for that one person had with them. So you're gonna see it here, um, the grinder, the lighter, um, you got your um, visine to mask the use. I mean, that sounds a little bit back corner there, but. Is there a way to drop one of the lights to see the screen a little yeah. better? So I just want to make sure you don't miss the detail. Thank you. Perfect. So at the top, you can see the raw tip. Um, they're just basically little rolling papers, um, but they're another um, tool to wrap marijuana. Um, and some of these you've seen before. I've, I've passed around the grape, the grape cigarellos, <coughs> the strawberry, and so on. But one of the things that I think is helpful for people to understand is when we see this in an evidence kit, or what people will describe as kit, law enforcement will say it's their drug kit, the way people are using is we usually see nicotine and marijuana together. We very rarely see just nicotine by itself. So that's the point I wanted to get across in terms of having folks understand the importance of talking to young people about vaping and nicotine use and its connection to marijuana. Should I talk a little bit about the grinder? Sure. This is the grinder. Um, you're gonna see a few of these in there. This has never been used, so there's no residue or anything here. But it's, I mean, it's a little bit, you know, <laughs> It's a little bit more than you remember maybe when you were in school and you saw people just basically had marijuana, this big, it's a cream cheese system. You basically put it in there, put this on top, you grind it, it screens it through and you get like a, a better product out of it. So. so the sophistication of what people are doing to use their marijuana, a grinder is considered commonplace. If you use marijuana, you have a grinder. So it's not like the dealer gives you brown marijuana and that's what you're gonna smoke. You know, people kind of put their kits together and do it the way that they want to and it's kind of very personalized. Any other thoughts on this one? Can I put the next one? Same, yep. same thing, I mean, you're gonna see the grinder up on the top. Um, these are different styles of, of wrappers. <coughs> um, actually up here, it's kind of tough to see, but that's a, a glass bowl or a pipe. Just another mechanism to get the marijuana in. Um, you'll see a lot of that. that they can you know, they can look like anything. They can be shaped like anything. Um, you'll see a little bit of brown residue of Burmox in the end, and they just sort of smoke it through the hole of the glass pipe. But again, multiple delivery systems uh, for one person. So I know I've passed around a lot of these to you all in different presentations. This is just from one person. So having a lot of sample of flavors, having their marijuana, which is sitting in their grinder, and then having their bowl. So people aren't doing it one way, they're doing it multiple ways. Do you mind if we pause for a question? Yeah. So on the, that, I have a question on the, is it the oil, the ear wax, yeah. or how do the, what's that go into a vape? Is that how they? It can. So there's different atomizer devices that it can be used through. Um, the shatter can be liquefied. So if the earwax is the sticky kind, there's a certain device you would use, like a certain type of vape. The shatter can be liquefied and also can be um, put in one of the um, pipe type of devices. That yes, yes, thank you. Just uh, so that slide, so um, the, it said the um, typical on the street marijuana, not synthetic, but <coughs> um, actual, is Which like is hydroponic. Okay, twenty yeah. percent um, THC, and that the earwax is eighty percent. Refresh my memory. What was it when there was a back parking lot here in the eighties? Ten to twenty percent potency THC, so the active ingredient. So earwax is 80%. So it's very similar to what we're learning about the opioid epidemic. Um, heroin is a very potent form of an opioid, but fentanyl is 80 times more powerful than heroin. Earwax is the fentanyl of marijuana. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. 
Um, and we'll kind of talk through some of those comparisons. Just a comment. Um, like heroin, fentanyl is often mixed into heroin, right. which makes it even more potent. The same thing with marijuana. You know, it's, you know, it looks, it's, looks like marijuana, but it's a lot more than marijuana. Mm -hmm. <coughs> um, so um, this was, um, we see a lot of mason jars uh, in terms of where people store their marijuana. Any guesses as to why people would use a mason jar? Keep it fresh. Just to seal, Keep it fresh. Seal tight. Seal tight. No smell. So lots of jam jars and mason jars. Um, Lieutenant Abadi, um, this also, you, 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 I don't think you can see well from your view, but there's cigarillo blunts that were in the mason jar. So the cigarillo blunts are the tobacco leaf and then marijuana is wrapped inside of them. Um, just another view, again, you can see a grinder here. So in all of the evidence kits, and we went through a box full that was maybe about this high, this wide, and, and overflowing, and in all the kits, um, we saw a grinder in almost every single one of them. So a grinder is very commonplace. Um, also storage devices, very common for folks to have their own storage container, either a mason jar, a jam jar, or these are sold in uh, Spencer's head shops and on Amazon. And they're, they usually have cartoon characters on them. So this is a, a teenage, I can never say this, teenage mutant ninja <laughs> turtle. Um, but what you can see here is, I don't know if this has, yeah. So see the size of the buds here? This is not sticks and um, junk marijuana. This is hydroponic marijuana which is grown in artificial, artificial settings with highlights. Um, there are orange strings that run through which create a higher potency. So this is high quality marijuana and this is the average of what we see. So it is more potent than marijuana from 20 years ago. Any thoughts? Uh, before we jump out of marijuana, I think we've kind of been touch about on the synthetic marijuana a yes. little bit. So you're talking about uh, earwax, but then there's the synthetic marijuana which is basically chemically treated marijuana. And that's a little bit more along the analogy of fentanyl and heroin because there's no real known chemical makeup. It, it all depends on what it is. And the other thing that that, that increases the, uh, the potency, the other thing that does is it makes it really difficult to um, find on drug tests. So when you're drug testing for regular marijuana, you're basically drug testing for the active THC of cannabis, whatever you want to call it. But when a person's using synthetic, it's popping up as different, a lot of chemists or biology call it an analog and things. Yep. It's how it pops up, so you have to be testing for that specific one. Um, Lieutenant Abadi, so has there been any um, research in terms of, uh, or inquiries when you uh, have an arrest or uh, whatever, relative to where they're getting it? Um, I imagine they probably aren't forthcoming, but I'm just wondering if the medical marijuana law has made it more available to uh, um, it has made it more available and the decriminalization decriminalization of it has which is also sort of kind of limited the arrest which has limited the amount of information you gather but in but terms of what we see filtered down to the kid level we see or the teen level we see mostly hydroponic marijuana not as much synthetic because synthetic you can buy on the internet and you can buy um, as um, plant material or non-edible plant non material in yeah. stores. So you don't necessarily need to know someone, a, a person with a medical marijuana card wouldn't be accessing synthetic marijuana. They'd be accessing more hydroponic type of marijuana and edibles. So it's a little bit of, it's kind of two different strands, but the um, synthetic is very easy to access. Um, as, and that's the things like K2 spice and um, some of the other things we've talked about. But this is more of what we would see if someone did access it via a medical marijuana user, it would be more the hydroponic type of higher quality THC marijuana. So that would go back to, I don't remember, remember the Patriot situation yeah. where, I don't remember which one it was. It was He's gone Chandler now. Chandler Jones. Chandler Jones. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <coughs> That's the kind of reaction you would see from yeah. synthetic marijuana. What was that? In general. What's that situation? I don't know. It. So last year, one of the Patriots players sort of turned himself in in the middle of the morning, shirtless at a police station. And when they had gone to investigate, they kind of figured out that he had used synthetic marijuana, possibly maybe, no one knows, but. He's been released, he's no longer released. He's been released. Oh. So it creates a, a, after the play. one <laughs> of the reactions that's pretty common is a high level of paranoia. So what it sounds like is after 
um, he came down from his high, you know, that was part of what they were able to ascertain is that he was so paranoid that he turned himself in. <laughs> so it, it works um, pretty tricky. And it, what's tricky also for health professionals is if someone comes into the ER and they do synthetics, again, it may not show up on a drug test, but it also is hard to ascertain what substances and chemicals they have in their system. So you can't really reverse the effects of a synthetic marijuana. Sometimes you just have to ride it out and treat their symptoms while they're feeling ill. And a lot of the reactions we see are psychiatric in nature. So paranoia, crying, depression, um, temporary, um, but a lot of upset feelings because they don't feel in control. Mr. Robinson. So, yeah, I, actually my question was about the medical marijuana too, and I, I just can't help to, you know, I know we watch the governor's speak, but there's a little bit of hypocrisy. Uh, when you get crocodile tears, uh, and these are the, these are the uh, people that are pushing that those laws, and at the same time they're pushing this, doesn't make any sense to me. Well, the governor in um, the the state senate has done a very um, thorough study on the impact of possible recreational legalization in Massachusetts, and Senator Lewis just came out with a very thorough report on how it would impact teens negatively. So there's been a lot of process, a lot of study that's been happening at the state level about if we were to change any further marijuana laws, what that might look like and what the impact could be. So although we had we had the vote that changed the medical marijuana availability, folks that are in state positions have done a lot of work to try to get the research and information out there about the concerns they have if the laws were to change again. So I do encourage people to visit Senator Lewis's website and read that report. There's a lot of really important information for parents there. Williams, do you have a question? Um, well, just curious as to um, its impact on drive. I know, I know it affects driving, but has that been something that your offices have yes. recognized and witnessed? And then, what are, what are the consequences for that? Similar to alcohol use, or it, yeah, you know? there's, so there's the OUI drugs now, which I mean, there's always been, but it's it's not exactly the same as OUI liquor because there's no automatic suspension. There's no breath test involved in it. Um, you have to, it kind of don't have a repercussion until you go to court, unless someone puts in a third year of that you have your license suspended, but it's a little harder to prove too. So the state keeps putting a big push on getting um, drug recognition experts certified. Those offices that go to about an 80 hour class and then they go out and they do a lot of um, field testing to get certified as a drug recognition expert. And then they're called in for all UIs that involve drugs and they do a 12 step process and typically call more than one drug that's on board the person. Like Erica talked about the poly drug use. I think the DREs find like a, over 70% of their cases have poly drug use, which is more than one drug on board. So not easy, but it's usually based on behavior, right? Is a lot yeah. of what the DRE, part of the, that process is looking at behavior um, and, do, and documenting it in a certain way to make sure that if the case were to move forward, there would be legitimate information that, that you could work with. But because Colorado is in a different place because of their laws, um, they have been developing other testing that possibly will come to market that could ascertain what substance is in the system. We don't know what that will look like in terms of laws or ability to use it, but at our no national conference for coalitions this summer, we will be getting a presentation from Colorado on lessons learned around particularly the drugs driving that we'll be able to share with our law enforcement to kind of stay ahead of the curve. Um, another grinder, this is our Barbie grinder. They typically are a kind of fun little ca uh, cartoon characters or things that harken back to um, what, whatever our teens now, their childhood memories are. Um, so you'll see things that um, were popular five, 10, six, seven years ago. Um, and this one um, has residue in it, so you can see, but the process works the same as the grinder that's going around that you saw. Um, you wanna talk a little bit about the yep. water bomb? Um. So you just have more like less sophisticated devices for smoking. Someone basically took a water bottle <laughs> and created a, a bong out of it. Um, I can't tell what that storage is, but it looks that sort of looks like, like maybe the bottom of a grinder with the yep. with the in a bag so you can mask the smell. Um, and that's just the tip of the bottle that's with the, tip the of the oil. And if you go to the oil. next one, there's I think there's a tin the can, can one, which is the same thing. Poke a couple holes in the tin can, use the other end of it. See some holes poked in there, and you just you know, deliver your own. So you I mean, those might not even be. Uh, uh, this is SR Mill Mulo's presentation. Those might have just been found on a camp trail or somewhere online. I'm not even sure what those are. Yeah. 
Um, this is another, um, what we call our mason jar specials because we see so many of the storage containers being mason jars. This is marijuana stuffed in the bottom of a sock, wrapped, and then put inside the mason jar again to mask the smell. But at the bottom of the little toe, it was packed full, probably this much marijuana bud, um, and then also one of the black pipes. Um, so Chair Abadi, you want to talk a little bit about fount? <coughs> so we talked a little bit early about masking the smell. Um, They'll, they could smoke the marijuana and actually exhale it through the bounce, so it smells more like the, um, the laundry than anything else. Um, again, yeah, I think there's a groin at the bottom here. Um, this is a beef jerky container. They took out the beef jerky and they keep the marijuana in it. Um, some of the other storage things. And then the other thing you like to just notice is that this, someone here is saving their roach ends. You can see how much they've actually smoked. And it's interesting compared to the size of the roach, which is the small one, and then like the blunt that we showed earlier, which was you know as fat as your finger. So different yeah. sizes, different amounts. Same thing with the pipe and the can. That might just be like one hit, and then they move on. Whereas with the pipe, no, the, the, um, the blunt can get a lot more. And so people will unwrap their roaches and then use whatever the whatever residue is left and roll up something else. Um, this is one that looks kind of like a glasses case, but it's um, a holder for a pipe. So when you actually open the case, the shape of the pipe is in there. But from the outside, it really just looks like a regular glasses case. Um, and those are sold um, in head shops and online. Um, that container is just another one of those cartoon char character containers that holds marijuana. So do these show up like when you're going into a concert or into a venue? It's, it's not metal, right? So it just goes through as a glass case. <coughs> Um, we have done some enhanced training with our school staff to help them identify and how to do better searches. Um, we did some training about a month ago. Officer Mueller designed an, um, kind of a hands-on, here's what to look for, here's how to identify some of it, because things are often hidden inside other things. So, um, but generally speaking, when people go through bags, they just kind of ruffle through really quick and they move on. And people count on that. <laughs> so, um, and we actually are having um, an exhibit this fall called Hidden in Plain Sight that you all will be invited to. We're gonna have a teen bedroom set up at the police station in our community room where parents and adults will get to walk through and see if they can find the hidden in plain sight paraphernalia items. So we'll give you a hands-on opportunity to see if you can find what we're asking parents to keep eyes out for. Um, and it's very enlightening. We have a little stock of items that some of our folks um, here have already seen in our office and a lot of it is very deceiving. It looks like just regular everyday items. Um, we'll talk just a little bit. Yep. I can't really just see it right, but. Transition to a couple other little drugs. Um, down on the bottom, and it's just a couple little half Adderall pills, just to show you the, the size and you know how easy it is to just kind of <coughs> conceal that and the sharing of prescription medication that's happening constantly you know, in the schools and outside of the school. And, and the street value of drugs that are prescribed to students, and sometimes students are asked to compromise um, a medication that they might need for themselves because they may want to impress a friend or make a profit off of it. And so it's important to continue to have that medication safety conversation with students who are already prescribed medication. Um, just um, This is considered a heroin kit, and I'll let Lieutenant Abadi describe it. Yep. Um, yeah, like she said, this is a heroin kit. That's a used bag, like that's an empty used bag of heroin. The, the typical spoon that you would see with some burn residue on the bottom, a hypodermic needle. Um, can't really that's the can, bottom yeah. of a Coke can. Okay. So another spot to, to heat it up so you can shoot it through with. It's typically what you would find in somewhere, if someone who works gets it to a job that's good. And so people are heating up the, the heroin um, with a, a lighter underneath the spoon or, or um, lighting up the bottom of the can. They heat it, um, they'll use a cotton ball to kind of get rid of some of the residue and then they'll draw from the needle what they consider to be the more purified form of heroin. So there's a whole process that goes through it. So when we think about looking for signs or symptoms, we look for cotton balls, we look for other things that are related to a heroin works kit. And so <coughs> for parents that have dealt with young people who suffer from opioid abuse, they start to notice small things like, geez, my spoons are missing, or why do they have all these cotton balls in their room? And so there's kind of some odd things that sometimes we don't put together because it doesn't make sense if you haven't been exposed to this. So we're just trying to get the word out there about looking for some of these maybe less obvious signs. This was a little, I think this is a little piece of tin foil maybe. Yeah. So sometimes you might see a little tin foil with a little black like snake trail on it. That's the same thing when they're burning, kind of creates like a little black snake trail. 
And um, this was a little hard to see, but um, a, a bag of heroin is this big. So we're talking the teeny tiniest corner of a um, Ziploc bag. So if I were to have a Ziploc bag for snacks, the corner that is like this big would be a bag of heroin. So finding this on someone, so this is 40 bags of heroin. Wow. It's very small. So to detect it from a law enforcement standpoint, for parents that are monitoring, it's not easy to find the stuff. It's very tiny. 40 bags took up a lot of space. Well, <coughs> how about what was that, that? This post-it note's actually the, on. That's the actual size, the post-it note, and so, so that's the 40 it's bags. It's probably the bottom of the bag there. Yep. It's really you can cover the whole thing with the post-it. Size of this over here. So I mean, that's relatively small considering. Yeah, I'm looking to the right, it looks really I kind of blew it up so you could see. But oh, this I is see. Actual size. Okay, so to the bags. right, it's enlarged. The same as the size of the post-it note. Oh my goodness. 40 bags would fit on that post-it note. So when you think 40 bags, you kind of think something different. So that's why we wanted to show you the visual. Um, this is um, crack cocaine that was taken off someone. Um, similar, very small amount of drug. This is more of a white powdery substance or it can be uh, crystallized yeah. right here. So four rocks. Looks like a big tube. Yeah. So these are some of, the, so we just want to give you a little bit of background of kind of what we see. Because some one of the things that we realized um, and Mike Milo inspired me to help put this presentation together working with Detective Halloran and some of the detectives that work for Lieutenant Abadi is sometimes we see things come in a certain way so it helps us understand how to talk to young people about poly drug use. But we wanted to get that point across to you so you could see what we mean by why these things go hand in hand. Is that making sense to folks? Okay. So some of the tools um, to address substance use and this is just a slide that relates to the high school but partly because we're doing the pilot there I thought I would highlight that. So we have our health courses in ninth and 11th grade. We do an annual training for our student leaders, our captains and our club leaders that we do with um, Mr. Zaya. So last year we had 65 young people that went through a day long training. We did scenarios. Um, if someone on their team were to show signs or symptoms, how would you handle it? How do you help a friend? How do you go to your coach? Those types of things. Also educating them about the chemical health policy. Um, we're hoping to expand our parent education and events this year and doing some more opportunities for parents. We have our youth mental health first aid training. We had 25 parents graduate, and I, I see one of my students in the room who graduated, um, was on the PTO for the high school, and uh, it's been great to have parents involved in the mental health first aid process. Um, we're looking at bringing in something new. It's called the Interface Referral Service. We had a presentation from William James College a couple weeks ago to our guidance department. And part of what inspired this is Wakefield has been using Interface for the last year. It is a tool that William James has put together where trained psychologists answer phone calls and help connect families to mental health services. They do a more thorough intake process and help find a match for a mental health provider. So one of the things that we often do when we refer someone to services is give them names or give them numbers. Mm -hmm. This is a little bit more of a personalized process to help find a match that's feasible for the family. So, so far we've um, looked at the service, vetted, looked at some of the ways it helped Wakefield, and we'll be having another presentation this summer, and we'll be coming back to you with more information about possibilities of using the service. But what it would help with is, it would give our clinical folks and our guidance folks a tool that they can use and pass on to families so that they can spend more time focusing on the student, rather than being on the phone with insurance companies and dealing with the process of referrals, which can take a lot of time. So the goal is to try to free up our resources by utilizing an outside service. We're gonna talk a little bit more about that. And this would be something that would be grant funded. Um, some of the monitoring, um, so our school staff has been getting increasing training on, on taking all you seriously. It's not always easy to identify though. As you can see, there's a lot of loopholes that teams can use to mask their use. So it's tricky. Um, we also have the resources of Recovery High School. They're very skilled at working with young people who suffer from substance use disorders. We have our chemical health policy. Um, we have our pre-trial diversion program, our school search and seizure policy that you all um, put forth, our breathalyzer policy. And then we're looking at our new screening program next year. So that's just a little bit of an overview that hopefully gives you a sense of where we're headed next year. I'm wondering if there's another youth mental health, the last one was Post canceled, postponed, is there another one coming? Yes, we will be having a series of classes in August. Um, so we will have a schedule for August that's coming out. And in September, all of our law enforcement will be getting trained. 
Um, so we are coming to the end of our two-year grant, um, and so far we have 503 people trained, and we hope by the end of the summer to have um, about 580 folks trained. So we will have a schedule that will that will be posted. I'll, I'll share it through Dr. Doherty to share with all of you. Yeah. Um, I think the parent education education piece is really important. Just from what I've personally learned from your presentation, which has been amazing, um, and when I have conversations with my peers, they're completely in the dark. And I'm sorry if anyone's listening and I said that, <laughs> but it's it's uh, I'm amazed at at how little parents know, and whether it's a question of they don't want to know. It, it's it's crucial, and I think I know we don't have health in middle school. It's one of the things that I, I still can't quite get past. It's important to reach out to the parents of the middle school students. This is all happening in middle school. Mm -hmm. We're kidding ourselves if we think it's not. So whatever we can do to educate the parents and get them in the room, I just <coughs> can't do it enough. I have a question about the aspect of the law related to the concussion training because um, I, and I know you said it's pretty early and the state hasn't given a lot of guidance, but so the concussion training module, you have to actually step through that module. It's this right can thing, you gotta answer the questions. So I, it seems like what is, what's available right now would be more like you can look at this, here's the resources, click on this. Is the idea that it's going to be something more like the concussion module, where you actually like are, are sort of taking the test, you're printing the certificate? We believe there will be a verification component. We don't yet know what that looks like. They haven't given us a lot of details. Yeah, we haven't gotten a lot of guidance from Desi. But there's there's <coughs> they're saying it will be like the concussion training, which makes us think it will be something that parents will have to step through and verify. And like the concussion training, that I believe has to be done by student and parent. Mm -hmm. There like will be will likely be a component that's similar to that. Um, but we also know that we can offer something that's enhanced, something that might work a little bit better for parents that exceeds the state guidelines. So we're also working over the next year to develop some opportunities for parents to get educated maybe differently by coming to an in-person event and verifying that. So we're gonna provide multiple options. We just don't yet know what the state will actually do. <laughs> so I, I like, I just, um, Ms. Rossi, like to say, like I, I really think that that's the right trajectory, and and to use you know the vast resources and input to develop something that we think we can get parents to actually look at. I and you know I'm not saying that whatever the state eventually comes up with won't be good, but it is you know it's a it's a it's definitely a have to do. And I've always thought that hey if we if we have to have parents check off that they learned about concussions. We ought to have them learn about uh, drugs. So, uh, but I I guess um, I shouldn't pass judgment on the concussion training thing, but I, I- Well, we're just not sure, will it be something that will be repetitive that parents will have to do once a year, once yeah. a season? We, those are some details that we don't yet have information on. So. We are looking at how to try to make it the best educational experience for parents and not just something that is kind of check a box. But we also know that sometimes the state can be scrambling and might release something that doesn't give us a lot of time to work with, but we, we will have an alternative in the wings to have options for parents. Okay, so we'll, we'll have with, sorry, I'm, I get confused with the letter. Um, will, will we have something for this school year? Yes. We'll, we'll have something for this yeah. school year to, that parents can inform themselves. Absolutely. Yes, but it may yeah. not be the final product this I, year. Uh, right, yeah. but it, as part of the pilot effort. Yes. Um, and, and, and we've tried to reach out to the state to help them hopefully build a better educational training program. We'll be working with our district attorney to hopefully get more information up the, up the, the train. We'll be reaching out to DPH and, and helping to connect them to resources that we believe are really valuable for parents to see particularly some of the, the information that comes out of Children's and some of the, the research institutions in Boston. So we'll be trying to help, we won't have a lot of influence, but we'll try to have whatever influence we can on making the state training better. But in the meantime, this year, we will offer a pilot parent program. Just a, I guess, editorial. The, the opiate law, I think, um, is a good start, but the thing that's concerning to me is there's minimal amount uh, towards prevention. It's really focused on intervention. So 
anybody who's watching at home, it's, it's like sticking your finger in the dike. It's not going to go away until we really concentrate on prevention and evidence-based prevention. And to that point, um, I just met with our elementary health educators um, this morning, and one of the things that um, they're to be doing next year is 10 lessons at in grades three, four, and five. And they'll be talking about medication safety in grade three, and look, talking about other drug use in grade four, talking about substance use in grade five. So we do still have that gap where we're trying to focus on trying to get some resources back for middle school, but we do have some resources that parents will have more information about what their children will be offered at elementary. And um, Dr. Um, Craig Martin will be kind of sharing more information about that, but we are working through that process to make sure that parents have a little bit more prevention information at an earlier level, coupled with an evidence-based program that we'll offer through our CASA called Active Parenting. So there's be two resources that parents will have at their disposal, an educational resource, as well as uh, an additional ancillary resource. Just one more comment from me anyways, that I think the most critical piece of this is that students, not you mentioned talk to them, but they have to develop skills. You yes, this is know. a skills-based It's gotta be program. a skills-based yes. approach. Yes, and I mean um, talk in the sense that medication <coughs> safety is integrated into the process, but it is a skills-based approach. I'd be interested to see how it looks. It's an incredibly um, important problem, so thank you for all that you're doing to solve it for us. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Thanks. There it is. <clears throat> oh, look at me. <laughs> <laughs> Are we going to talk a little bit about um, saying goodbye to Ms. Seibert and finding a replacement for her next? Yes. So in your packet is a draft timeline um, of the, the search process um, for the Director of Finance and Operation. Um, this, this position is a little bit different. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. This position is a little bit different um, from other search processes is that the school committee plays a major role um, in the appointment of this position. Um, so we have a screening committee in place um, they actually had their first meeting today. You can see it's a cross-section of different community and staff members. Um, and uh, Julie is the uh, school committee member that is representing the school committee on this, on this committee. <coughs> and um, so this position has been posted since June 7th. The closing date is July 1st. Uh, there were two meetings this week with the screening committee. One was today to really go over the um, the process and um, signing the confidentiality agreements. Uh, on the 30th, they'll be designing the questions and they'll be coming up with a series of questions um, based on uh, the information. We did send out a, a, a uh, survey to the community asking them for their feedback. And so the questions will be based on not only the feedback from the community, but um, the different perspectives that each of the screening committee members have um, in relation to uh, the, the position. Uh, there will be an all-day series of interviews on the 8th of July. Uh, we'll be conducting those interviews. Uh, at that point, uh, once they recommend a, a, a group of pre-finalists, um, I'll go through a vetting process of those pre-finalists, checking references, um, and then I will hand over to the school committee finalists that, they, that you will be interviewing on the, uh, the 18th of July. Um, and then on the 20th of July, um, you'll be uh, voting on an appointment. Um, so that's, that's the draft timeline that, that I have presented to you. Any questions? Yeah, I, I just had a question. The town manager or designee, so I just was wondering. So it's uh, Sharon Angstrom, the town account. Yeah. I'm sorry, I, I, I thought there was an updated. We, we have actually one that has all the names. And is the building principal it's, uh, it's Adam Bacher. I'll just go through them all for you. Um, we have uh, Krista Morello from Food Services, and Joe Huggins is also involved. Um, Adam is, uh, as I mentioned, the, the building principal. Um, the teacher is Kristen Killian, who does a lot of work with Martha and in, in the, with the student activities. Um, we, uh, and the central office staff member is, is Paula Centar Centapio, who works here in the office. 
We do not have a community member. But uh, Julie does represent the community as well, so. <laughs> is it still open for a community? No, our, our feeling was is that we really needed to move forward with this process. Um, so I think the committee that we have in place will be very strong. Um, it's a very strong group of people that will be able to provide the feedback and the input necessary. Can you give us a sense of how many applications? Um, I honestly don't know at this point. I haven't looked recently. I do get emails when, when we get an application. I get a notification, but I haven't gone on to check to see how many. And I just want to add to the timeline. Uh, <clears throat> this is a good plan, I think. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm getting over a cold. Um, but in the event that we don't find a candidate that we're satisfied with, we will certainly go back out Absolutely. and continue to look. Yes. So that's very important to say that it's important. Um, the town has offered good. their support um, if we are unable to find a replacement um, in a timely manner. Okay. Any other questions or comments on this? Mr. Chair, move to approve the Director of Finance search process and timeline as presented. Second. I have a second. Great. Any other comments or questions about this? Just a thank you to Ms. Siebert for um, all you did during the grueling year. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Thank you. When's Mardi Gras August 5th. August 5th. Oh. So we'll see a little more. Any other comments or questions? Are we ready for a vote? All those in favor? 6 0. Very good. Shall we talk since we're talking about finance? Yes. We'll talk about some budget transfers. Well, first, let's do the financial update okay. of where we are for the year. Um, and uh, just give a, a brief explanation on, on why the, the financials changed from what went out on Friday to today. Um, so there was a change from the initial transfer memo and update that went out on Friday. The, it was a $100,000 change. Um, Sharon Angstrom, the town accountant, and I had discussed the proposal of modifying the offset to the athletic revolving fund. Um, and when Dr. Doherty and I had looked at the financials last week, we were looking at it through the lens of FY17 impact. And, and you know, for, through the budget process, we were forecasting that the ending revolving balance from the athletic fund was going to be um, very low and based on where we are th through FY16 it really looks like it will probably end in a negative so our lens was we wanted budget certainty for FY17 and that's why initially we had thought we would recommend the committee take a vote to lessen the offset for this year um, I met with Sharon last week and we had discussed it and upon further reflection she reached out to John and I today to say she really felt um, that it was in our best interest to take the full offset this year and there are other remedies available next year if that does come to fruition it's just a forecast right now so it might not happen it, it might end up in a, in a positive balance not a negative balance and a couple of those remedies are to use operating funds to offset it or to go to to the finance committee and ask for additional funds for the revolving funds so from time to time that does happen on the town side and you'll go to the finance committee so so that was her recommendation and John and I thought it was a thoughtful one and we had a very good conversation and and we agreed and and that's why there was an updated memo and new budget transfers that went out today to reflect that change in the initial forecast and so the budgeted if I can just ask the budgeted um, deficit is in the low tens of thousands of dollars yeah. right it's not it's like 19,000 right. yeah so it's and I'll talk through some okay. specifics about what happened with the revolving fund as we go through the update oh Mr. Oh, so just uh, John I talked briefly on the on the remedies uh, that w when when she says go to the finance committee to to get it from where to so the, a fund transfer I don't you know we if we got to that we could discuss it but I don't think that's what the reserve funds here supposed to be used for but yeah I, I think there would be several steps before we reach that point uh, we would take a look at the other cost centers to see if there was transfers that could be made into that cost center um, before we got to that point. But if we were in a significant deficit that we had to, that would be a last resort. Yeah. 
but that was the suggestion that she had brought up today that that the town does do that on a regular basis and we could do that as well and, and maybe I didn't quite get it but so the hundred thousand dollars that you said is that going to this year's or that's going to be added to next year's no it's not added to next year so this year we had a budgeted offset of three hundred eighty thousand dollars and when we were looking at the projection of that ending revolve that revolving balance go going forward that revolving fund going through forward if we took the full offset this year there's a high probability that it'll end up in a deficit next year and so we were looking at it from a lens of let's let's make sure we have budget certainty for next year so we initially suggested taking a two hundred eighty thousand dollar offset this year to leave an extra hundred thousand in the revolving fund so that we had budget certainty for next year so I'm still so offset from where are we looking at a specific line item I'm not the, the athletic revolving fund so all right so but we're talking about it's in a negative no, it's not in no, the negative right now. No. Oh, it, okay. it could be a year from now. Oh, all right. All right, all right. Yeah. And so we were trying to look ahead to avoid that yeah, to happen. I didn't get that part. Okay. Okay. Sorry. No, that's, that's fine. That's fine. So, um, so the updated financials that you have in front of you have um, an unencumbered balance of about $234,000, which represents about 6.6% 6 .6 of our revised appropriation. Um, the forecast includes projected salaries and other expenses, as well as all of our school end of year purchases have been um, mostly spent out at this point. There's still a few left to do. Um, and all of our budgeted revolving fund offsets will be taken at what the budget was. So the FY16, um, we've already processed most of them. There's a few more for Sharon and I to go through, but all of them will be taken at what we had budgeted. There are two cost centers that will be in the negative as a result of some of these assumptions, and I'm going to talk through those in, in a little more detail. But starting with the first one, the administrative cost center is going to have about um, just under $11,000 in savings. That's really the result of an open position that was left open, was vacated in, in mid-December, and we didn't backfill that position, and the resulting savings were about $25,000. Those savings were used to offset some additional expenses in the HR area. We had three searches for principals this year. We had a, a number of district-wide positions that opened up. Um, and we also had an, a, a higher expenses when it came to employee physicals. So a lot of that <coughs> savings got eaten up by um, some additional expenses. We will be recommending that we transfer some of this surplus to the um, school building maintenance to uh, offset that deficit balance. Um, when we get to the district-wide program cost center, it's forecasted now to finish the year with a surplus of just under $50,000. Um, this is due, uh, the two lines that are really driving that are the health services and the athletics. The health service, there was a turnover in a nursing position at one of our schools this year that resulted in, in significant salary savings. And um, the athletics, it's it was uh, when going back to look at the detail of it, it was the churn in our coaching staff this year. So a number of coaching positions changed, turned over, and um, and so some of those were filled uh, with less, uh, you know, lower step. Um, so that was a, a driving force in that. Um, so we do have concerns about the athletic revolving fund which I, I started with. Um, we are concerned that FY17 may end with a deficit balance, and, and so it will have to be closely monitored in FY17, the balance of that fund. Um, if the fund were to end in a deficit balance, as Dr. Doherty and I said, and, and Sharon Angstrom, there, there are remedies available to the committee to address that if that were to come to fruition. A couple of things happened this year. So this was the first year with the new fee and cap structure. So we have about, on average, we have about 1,300 students that participate in fall, winter, and spring sports. And when we looked at raising the fee from $215 to $250, about a 16% increase, and we adjusted the cap from 800 to 950, the incremental revenue that we thought we would achieve with that, based on our, um, our reaching the cap and the number of financial assistance, we thought we were going to get about an incremental $40,000 of revenue. 
it's been about 31,000. So really the analysis has to be done to say, was it a function of participation? Was it a function of more financial assistance? Or was it a function of the cap? Um, and that analysis, I haven't had an opportunity to do that analysis yet, but I do know that we're, it's about an $11,000 shortfall from where I thought we were gonna be with user fee revenue versus where we actually ended up. So that's driving a little bit of, of the gap there on the ending balance for that revolving fund. I don't want to rush through. Does anyone have any questions on that? Um, so we will have to perform an analysis to figure out what, what is actually driving it. Was it more families reach the cap? Did more families apply for financial assistance? Or did our participation go down? And I know um, anecdotally participation did go down in a few sports. And, and some of that was due to um, the coaches making the decision not to carry as many kids on the team because they weren't getting as much play time. So instead of carrying 50 kids, they carried 45. So, so there may have been decisions like that that impacted participation as well. And so it, it'll be tough to gauge whether participation is down due to a coaching decision or down due to people didn't go out because the fee was off-putting. I don't know. But we'll try and do our best to, to answer some of those questions. Um, Moving on to school maintenance, school building maintenance budget. Um, the deficit balance there is really a result of the additional managerial staff that we had during the director transition and the transition to the, the new structure. Um, this is one that we've been talking about um, through the course of the year. And now that we're at the end of the year and it really is, um, it, it's gonna be close to, close to $50,000. So we are gonna ask for a budget transfer to um, correct that deficit. So if I can just uh, just uh, add one piece to that. So there was a position developed, um, created a town meeting in November that was in the town core budget, but we were carrying the salary in the school budget. So this is a one-time anomaly because we were in transition, and now really all we have left is the school custodian piece with the one manager. Um, moving on to regular day, um, really there hasn't been a lot of uh, swing in that cost center from previous reports. Um, as you know, there was an additional 1.0 FTE for ELL um, that was necessary due to some of the increases in our ELL population. Um, we did experience some increase in our transportation costs due to um, some homeless transportation that we had to, to cover, the mandated. Um, as you can see, the high school salary savings really kind of funded some of the uh, changes within the account, within the uh, cost center. Right now, the special education cost center is forecasted as with a deficit balance. That's really a function of Carolyn and I have thoughtfully um, met and gone through all where we're at at this point in the year. And we feel we have enough, uh, if with a budget transfer, we can comfortably probably pre prepay almost $300,000 in tuition, which would really set us up well for next year um, in terms of, of taking a little bit of pressure off the FY17 budget. Um, there were a couple things that we did identify that we, that e both of us really weren't thinking of. Um, some of the summer programs started this week. So there's four days in June <laughs> that we have to account for. Um, and so our summer program doesn't start until next week, until July, but some of the other um, summer placements for some of our art district kids started today. And so the transportation costs and the actual daily rate for those first four days have to be captured in, in this year's expenses. So that was, uh, that was one that we uncovered this week. Um, as I mentioned in previous meetings, Mass General Law does allow us to prepay up to three months of tuition, and Carolyn, Anne Marie, and I are thoughtfully going through a list right now to figure out wh what we may or may not want to pay um, to achieve that $300,000 prepay. And um, I think that's uh, I think that's it for my updates. I'm not sure if there are questions. I just said on the athletic. Uh, revolve or shortfall in, in fund uh, I obviously I'd be very interested to know whether it was enrollment or uh, uh, you know whether how we change the cap I mean that's that's important to know uh, you know and I guess you know we have to 
do what we have to do but i mean i i know that you know when we built the budget we were very careful and asked a lot of questions and i think you know we may have asked are, are we putting ourselves in peril and we did and we are now so uh i guess uh, i guess i'm just venting a little bit it's uh, uh concerning that uh you know yeah. no and I appreciate that it um, when the budget was developed in in November into December um, we really we had collected fees for fall and just starting this the winter we don't, people don't hit the cap until spring and yeah. sometimes that that's a difficult thing to see when when people are going to hit that cap and um, I absolutely will go back and do that analysis because our trend had been between 10 and 15 percent of our total revenue would be, you know, I don't want to say written off because that's not right accounting term, but would would not be collectible because of a cap or, or financial assistance. And so I really do want to look to see, well, what did that percentage end up being? Because I had modeled it based on 15%. Did it end up being 20? Was there more financial assistance or did more people hit the cap? And um, so I, I don't know the answers to those questions, but those were all ones that I, I do want to answer for the committee. I, I think the bottom line, I think this is where you're going, is that when we develop FY18 budget, we're going to have to use a lesser offset to the athletic revolving fund. And there was a lot of discussion right. about that. Uh, yeah. I think it also speaks to, <coughs> I know that you and, <coughs> excuse me, Sharon Engstrom did a lot of work this year on the revolving funds, particularly the big four, and really going through where expenses appropriately charged. and. Um, and I, I think that was celebrated both in the town and school side as really collaborative and good work. But as I remember it, we'd sort of said there's going to be a second phase to this. And maybe for the FY, not maybe, we said for the FY18 budget, um, you know, you had in the budget book articulated the description of each revolving fund, which was hugely mm -hmm. helpful. I mean, until you did that, they were just names. Mm -hmm. Now people could say, oh, what is that fund? Oh, you know, what is it used for? Do, do we use an <coughs> offset? Is it, you know, just expenses? Um, I, I know we've had, um, so I, I my anticipation is for the next budget, and this is a great um, <laughs> question <laughs> during interviews, um, is articulating a, a sort of guideline for each revolving fund. So we generally keep X amount of dollars. We use this kind of an offset. So having a clearer articulation in the budget book, I think, would be, um, it was something we'd said it was going to be a two-step, we did step one, and for F I team, we're going to do step two. I think this speaks to why that's a good idea. Mm -hmm. Any other questions or comments on that? Do you have any more for us? Um, I, unless you want to move into the um, <coughs> the memo on um, on the actual budget transfers, or do I? Is that are there questions about the transfers, or let's do? I don't want to jump ahead. No, why don't you keep going and okay. we'll do the motions all at once? Okay. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Corrin. Yes. Uh, just a question. for the athletic revolving fund, wouldn't the first if, if there is a negative balance, wouldn't the first line be easier to run the number? An assistant vice position or something to reduce the expenses on that? <laughs> on that end? I mean, rather than going to the fine income and asking for more money, that you look at it and say, as I, as I mentioned to Mr. Robinson, there's a lot of steps we can take before we go to the Finance Committee. I mean, that, the one and, remedy and here was, you know. Certainly a reduction in position could be one of those. The other thing I was. Um, looking at the breakdown in the, the packet for the special needs, and I noticed that Birch Meadow had, you know, $850,000. They were given an extra, a, a budget amendment for another 96, and they're still 100 and almost $150,000 over budget for the year. And I just wondered whether there's any particular insight. Was that the DLC program moving from, I see Kilton, uh, Barrows is, that's exactly that's exactly what it, it is. Just, it, it so got when we developed, yes. Yeah, so when we developed the budget, we um, we didn't identify which positions, and we we didn't move them over. We developed them as if they were staying in Barrows, and they actually did transfer to Birch Meadows. So um, we just didn't go back and move the budget. So that expect, explains the one hundred twenty five thousand that was was not spent at Barrows. Correct, and the one hundred forty seven that was spent by Birch. It's effectively a wash. Anything else, Mr. Cohen? And then the, the transfers, I guess we're kind of getting a little ahead of that, but the, the transfers and that would revert to free cash, and so we're looking to 
move things around to cover some deficits and, and not return the money as free cash to the town because there are things, I mean, like the special education with the deficit balance, and like now we're going to transfer some money from somewhere else to prepay next year, which it seems a little um, funny moving stuff around. No, and I appreciate the question, it's a thoughtful one. Uh, if, if the the school committee were to say no to the budget transfers, with the exception of the school building maintenance one, we would just prepay less. And this, the special education forecast includes the $300,000 prepay. That's why it's at a deficit of $44,000. So if the school committee under its purview said, no, we don't want to do that, we would just prepay less tuition and, and return a little bit more to free cash. We're still returning to free cash here. Two hundred and thirty-four thousand. Right, we're still returning. We're still ending up returning 06 percent of two hundred and thirty-four thousand to free cash, which again, for as long as I've been on this committee, we have returned some amount of money every year. And I, I I'm sorry, this is what I was doing. I find that um, we get we get perceived as you know not doing a, a good job budgeting. We like never ask for more. I, I don't know how many years I've been, but probably fifteen years on this committee. And we very, we have never come and asked for more money. But yet, it, the, the view is that either we're not being transparent or, you know, well, we didn't do a good job because we're going to return this free cash. I am not feeling particularly comfortable with where we're going to leave the athletic revolving account personally. And, uh, you know, would I understand the process went on. I'm going to support that. But I would rather... Um, you know, have done, taken an approach that helps uh, give us a little bit of a cushion for next year. And I, and I just want to say, um, there, I was going to say, there's, there's like athletics, when you talk about cutting athletics, you get a lot of people in the room. So it is sort of, and that, that's a tr I think that's a true statement. Yeah, I, but we did talk about cutting Latin this year, and we got a lot of people in the room. So, um, when we talk about you know reducing coaches just remember that means we're reducing we we can't serve students when we reduce coaches or teachers we're not serving as many students so you know those were difficult dis discussions when we had this budget last time i, I don't want people to walk away from this conversation <laughs> saying we're cutting coaches yeah. <laughs> that I, is no, that's no. so i just I, I, right I, if if and it's a big if we end up with a deficit, or we're looking like we're ending up with a deficit in next year's athletic budget at the end of the year. There are other steps we can take prior to that happening before we go to the Finance Committee. Cutting a position could be one of those steps. It's not something I would recommend. I think we need to take a look at the whole picture before we go down that road. So I think we've got to, we're not cutting coaches <laughs> at this point. And but but can, I, can I go one step further? The budget we're talking about was developed, this is an FY16 budget, so this was developed over a year ago. Mm -hmm. And we made a commitment when the revolving funds were getting looked at um, by Martha and by Sharon, um, is that we would spend out the offset that was voted on by the school committee and by town meeting. So that's what we're doing. Mm -hmm. and, and just to clarify, uh, Within these cost centers, you as superintendent and your staff have the authority to move money as needed within a within cost a center, cost correct. Center. But under Mass General Law, when you want to say, you know what, we projected this and X, Y, and Z didn't happen, and we have a surplus in this cost center, and we say have a deficit in athletics, school committee, would you please take this money that we didn't need over here and put it over here? It has to come before us, and we have to approve it, but it is under our purview to do right. so. Mm -hmm. So that's another remedy. And, and you know, this FY16 budget was first developed in November of 2014. Mm -hmm. So a right. lot happens in a budget year yeah. from the time that it was developed. Um, so Kindergarten enrollment alone yeah. every single year <laughs> so, is a, a big question mark. Mr. Roberts. I think just to the, to the coach question, uh, the, the athletic bu budget in general includes a bare bones amount of coaches most of the coaches that we have are paid for by uh, uh, donation groups so you know by cutting a coach you could effectively be cutting a sport because we don't i, don't, I mean I'm, most most of the sport coaches are just one coach per sport or maybe for football there's a few 
Yeah, most of the assistance, not all of them, but most of them are per paid for by uh, donations. Don donations. Student, yes, parent groups. by booster yeah. groups and stuff. Oh, Mr. And, and such a serious topic, just to add a little levity, I don't know if anybody except John and I might appreciate it, but Dr. Wells used to say, if you want to get a lot of people at a meeting, you talk about the three Bs, band, busing, and balls. <laughs> I don't know if he left out the Latin, but he was pretty shrewd, though. Uh -huh. <coughs> anybody else on the committee have a question? No. Oh, okay. Mrs. Stancy. Thank you. I don't know Projected remedial expenses from Wood End is of roughly sixty thousand dollars, which means that Wood End will be at a fifty-five thousand dollar deficit. Um, I'm just wondering, Mrs. Sandy, are you in the memo or on the spreadsheet? On the spreadsheet. The spreadsheet. The spreadsheet. The spreadsheet. Thank you. Um, I was just wondering, what caused the increase at Wood End? Um, I'm going to say it's additional staffing. But I would have to, because the only thing that's going to drive that number is going to be staffing. Yeah. So it, I would imagine that it was additional resources needed for the various programs. Okay, thank you. Jeff, you have a question? Oh, yes. Sure. Um, back to the, the 234000 in free cash. Um, I think actually at town meeting we approved this year extra money for the first phase of the science curriculum implementation. That was above the previous, it was like it fit into this year's budget, so they. They appropriated it. Does it make sense to do another piece of science curriculum out of that $230,000 rather than returning it to free cash and then asking for it again next year? Well, we wouldn't be asking for it again next year. We'd be going into the development of the FY18 budget. So it wouldn't be a separate item at town meeting. It so would my understanding was we approved at town meeting a piece of the science curriculum, but not the whole thing, right? So it's like it's year, year one, that's year correct. One. So can we use this 230000 to pay for um, buying the curriculum materials for... In, in theory, yes. Okay. And and we, we've we done a little bit of that. Um, in reality, no, because it's, you know, trying to phase in multiple years and crunching them is a capacity issue. And we want to make sure we do this right. Um, you know, so we are doing a little bit of that uh, with the funding that's become available. But I, I don't think you could do it all in one year. I mean, I think we learned from... And I'll let, I can let Craig talk more about this too, but I, I think it's it's a more it's a better approach when you phase something in, so that the students as they go along are getting the the skills and building upon them, moving along the. I just thought if, if there were some, like a bunch of textbooks that need to be bought, whether you can buy them now, mm -hmm. even though you won't use them next year, but would use them the following year, they're presumably we're still planning to do that same curriculum, so. And we are looking at some of those, but I don't think we can do all three years in, in one year. Especially because any money out of this needs to be spent by Thursday. Thursday. Like Thursday. Yeah. yeah, I was just doing the math in my head. Like, yeah, Thursday. Yeah, so we, I mean, yeah the fiscal year ends Thursday. So we also don't want to spend money just for the sake of spending money. Okay. Okay, so um, <laughs> there are two transfers before you. Um, um, we probably have a motion for the first one for the school building maintenance, as we mentioned earlier, that really was a function of um, of additional staffing that we carried on on the town side, on the excuse me, on the school side, while the open position was on the town side. And as John said, that was that's really a one-time, one-year issue. Um, and the second uh, motion you probably have before you is to move money um, to special education. Um, and that will allow us to, to hopefully hit that magic uh, 300000 in prepaid tuition. Okay. So. Madam Chair, move to authorize the transfer of $5,000 from the Administrative Cost Center and $45,000 from the Regular Day Cost Center, totaling $50,000 to the School Building Maintenance Cost Center. Any questions or comments on those transfers to the school building maintenance cost center? I have, it's really a comment more than a question. Oh, sure. But when we make these transfers, they become the baseline budget that goes, they are reflected in the historical budget numbers that we see moving forward. So when we move money, when we look at the FY18 budget, 
the numbers of FY17 reflect all of these transfers. Yes, they will. So that's just an important point to make that mm -hmm. when we look at last year's numbers, we're looking at what we actually spent last year in the particular categories. Uh, yes, you'll be looking at actual expenses. Right. Yes. Yep. <coughs> you'll be lo looking at, um, so forward looking, you'll have FY17 budget yep. compared to FY18 budget, but you'll have FY16 actual expenditures. So where we end up will, will be what, Is you what you're looking at. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anything else? Ready for a vote? All those in favor? 6-0. <clears throat> Madam Chair, move to authorize the transfer of $57,000 from the regular day cost <coughs> center to the special education cost center. Any questions on this one? Again, th this is driven predominantly by staffing needs that were federally mandated, I assume. And we had some students move in around special education. We had students who move in that we can't predict the cost in their own the tuition to an out-of-district placement. Yeah. It, it, it has a $300,000 prepaid. If you pulled that $300,000 out, you'd, you'd be, be a, a, you know, a $250,000 surplus. Very good so point. <laughs> yeah, very good point. <laughs> Any other questions or comments? carrying over from mm -hmm. previous years. Exactly. Yeah. Anything else? Okay, all those in favor? Six, zero. Thank you, Ms. Sutton. Thank you. All right, shall we go into, that was wrapping up FY16. We're going to skip FY17. No, we're going to skip 17. Yeah. <laughs> Talk about FY18. <clears throat> um, so I, we, we've had a, some discussions recently about FY18. Um, a lot of the slides that you're going to see this evening, you've seen at various different meetings, ranging from the community listening sessions to some of the retreats that we've had. I'm not going to go in as much detail as I have in the past. I, what I would like, though, is to go through all the slides, and then if there's questions, take them at the end sure. uh, to keep the process moving. Yep. Um, so this slide you've seen before, this is possibly what FY18 could look like with the assumptions that currently the town manager has presented with a 0.7% increase um, in, our, in uh, both town and school budgets after accommodated costs are, are taken out. Um, and you can see that what we're looking at for FY18, um, assuming uh, expenses are going at similar uh, increases that we're currently seeing over the last few years, is about a $2 million uh, difference. Um, I think what do I want to refer this to moving forward is the structural deficit. So when you see this term structural deficit, it's, it's this $2 million that we're, that we're talking about. And the increases are, are driven by cost of living adjustments, which would include steps in salary increases that are comparable to previous years, special education, tuition, and transportation increases, which really increase at the rate of 3 to 5% a year. Uh, regular day transportation, uh, which we just did a contract, and so we know that there'll be an increase each year with that. And then a decrease in some offsets, which is what we just talked about, and that will have an effect on um, your, your operating budget, if you're taking less from the offsets, such as athletics, it is going to have an effect on um, the operating cost. We also have in here the second year of the science curriculum implementation. So that's where that um, projected expense number is, comes from. And again, we're looking at estimates back of the envelope. We're, we're looking at something that's not going to happen for another two years, you know, so we have to, you know, we have to be cognizant of that. Um, one of the questions that was asked at the community session is can we just reduce expenses without reducing staff? Um, you know, and as you know, this year, unfortunately, we've had to reduce staff. But if we tried to do this exercise for FY18 with the assumptions that we have trying to cut that $2 million, um, the school department budget is very heavy personnel um, because that's the business that we're in is educating children. Um, 
So our wages would be about close to 36 million, expenses are around seven. Um, so if you take those $7.15 million uh, expense budget and it's broken down by cost center in millions, um, you could see 210,000 uh, for administration. That includes legal, which you do have to have some uh, uh, budget for legal fees, and audit, which is mandated, employee physicals, which is mandated, um, and, and licensing of different types of software. Uh, regular day, really the only expenses in regular day are your teaching materials and supplies and professional development and technology. Um, perhaps you could reduce that a little bit, um, but those are costs that would be at one time. You really would need to put those back in the following year. Special education, a lot of this is mandated by individualized education plans of students. Transportation, out of district tuition, adaptive text and materials. There isn't a lot you could reduce there. Um, school facilities, as you know, what really is left now um, in this budget is that's, that would be expenses is our, our contracting service for cleaning and the supplies to do the cleaning, um, as well as paper towels, toilet paper, things like that. Um, and then our district-wide programs, uh, health, which really it's your medical supplies, band-aids, things like that, and extracurricular and athletics, which is very heavy personnel, but there were things in there like busing and ice rental and uh, gym rental for um, uh, things, uh, a pool rental for the Y, things like that. And then our technology infrastructure. Um, so again, there isn't a lot you can cut out of expenses um, without affecting, without having to go into personnel. So as an ac exercise, let's say we could cut $300,000 out of expenses, um, <coughs> which would be things like professional development, technology, curriculum materials, classroom supplies, and then maybe some other miscellaneous expenses. That still leaves close to 1.7 million in wages that we would need, in personnel that we would need to reduce. Um, if you look at teaching <coughs> positions, and not that all of the reductions would be teaching positions, assuming that an average teacher salary is, uh, for the positions that would be reduced is $55,000, you're looking at about 30 FTEs of teachers. Um, so there will be significant reduction of personnel, teachers, support staff, administrators, um, if we reach that point. This leads to higher class sizes, elimination of program, and reduced student support. So that is going with the assumptions that um, have been communicated up to this point um, in our presentations. We do have other challenges. So that's the structural deficit, but moving forward, we have other challenges as well and we've talked about these challenges in numerous uh, presentations over, starting over a year ago when we had the listening sessions for the community. So here are the, uh, here are the areas. I'm gonna go in a little bit of detail um, in each of these areas. The first one being retaining and attracting staff. Um, you know, this year we had to reduce uh, positions in the FY17 budget. Uh, 6.3 of the 7.3 positions with teachers. Um, <coughs> We also know that we have had several teachers and administrators leave the district over the last four years for a variety of reasons, um, ranging from uh, family situations to leaving the, leaving the state um, to working conditions and, um, and salaries and health benefits. So, uh, you know, that, that certainly is, is a concern. And, you know, we've, we've looked at the salary scales of all of the, the 30 comparable communities that we look at, and the Reading teacher salary scales um, is in the bottom half of the 30 comparable communities. So, so th certainly this is an area that's a challenge. So the resources that would be needed through this would be um, COLA adjustments through the collective bargaining process and additional support for administrators for supervision and evaluation. Another challenge is developing well-balanced and prepared students for college and career. Um, there's a lot of areas of focus that, that we have been working on, ranging from the implementation of a new science curriculum to uh, implementing new health and wellness curriculum, addressing social-emotional needs. You can see there restructuring schedules at all three levels, um, looking at our Wednesdays at the elementary level, 
and restructuring that so that we have full days of school. Um, making sure that our students are competitive with other area students for college acceptances and that would be looking at increasing AP and honors course offerings um, and providing support for students that are struggling academically, socially, emotionally. So resources that are needed, you can see you're located there, ranging from middle school health teachers um, to high school teachers uh, to the year two and three implementation of science curriculum to uh, elementary teachers and paraeducators for the Wednesday conversion and restructuring to other supports for uh, academic and social emotional for students. Um, so those are all things that are part of this challenge. I also put down full day kindergarten um, because I know that's a discussion that has been out in the community uh, and that certainly would come tied in with other challenges which include space so um, we'll, we can talk more about that later. Um, another area of challenge uh, supporting teachers and administrators as we transition to more rigorous standards um, and we want to make sure that we have and maintain updated technology and infrastructure so that teachers can use um, the electronic resources to implement new curricula. Um, we want to make sure that we have adequate supervision and support. I've showed you slides in the past that talk about the, the ratio of supervision for our <coughs> administrators. Um, at the elementary level, we're looking at 40 to 60 staff member a year that are being supervised. At the middle school, it's a little bit less, and at the high school, it's, it's about the same. Um, to be able to give teachers that adequate supervision and support is absolutely critical. Um, it is also ties back into retaining and attracting staff um, in that if you have administrators that have a very high caseload, um, that leads to burnout. Um, so those are, those are some of the things that, that are a challenge that we're, that we're facing. We want to also make sure that we have the training, the time, and the support for our teachers. Um, and I think we've made some great progress over the last couple of years. Uh, with our professional learning communities and the work that that the professional development committee and Craig and the curriculum leaders have done with those professional learning communities and we're starting to see evidence that it's starting to work. Um, <clears throat> so the resources that were needed is we want to make sure we maintain those current levels um, of support that we have. We want to restructure our existing leadership positions but we also need to add some supervisory curriculum leadership positions. Um, we also want to make sure that we keep two positions that are in our school transformation grant that we are seeing great benefits from, the data analyst and the administrator for social emotional learning. Those are currently in the school transformation grant. And then moving on to the next area is special education programs, improving those services and in district programs. And you know, Carolyn has, has done a great job using that Walker report as, as a way to continually improve what we're doing in our in-district programs to make sure that they're as strong as they can be so that we can um, keep our students in district for two reasons. One, um, so that students are with their peers, but another reason too um, is financially in that it is much less expensive. We're working on a slide now that we're going to show you in the future. Um, to show uh, the cost benefit of having students stay in district versus going out of district. Um, because when a student leaves out of district, it's very difficult for that student to come back to the school district. So if a student leaves in elementary school, um, by law, in, it, in some instances, that student is educated till they're 22. Um, and that comes with a cost. So those are the types of things that um, we're going to produce some data to show, to show you that down the road. Um, so the resources that are needed to move this forward and to continue to move this forward is to make sure that we have additional administrative support in the district special education office so that we can have that supervision in our programs so that we, those programs can continue to be developed. Um, so Carolyn has the time to be able to work with staff, work with um, principals to make sure that those programs are strong as they can be um, and an assistant director would be necessary to take off the plate 
um, of Carolyn and others, some of those things that, that really could be done by others. Um, in addition, having additional clerical support so that our team chairs are not doing, and, and teachers are not doing the paperwork, but it, we have clerical support to do that so that they can spend more time working with kids. Um, and then the professional development time and training that's necessary to do that. And then this all leads to space. Um, and you know some, some of the things that, have, that are happening for next year is an indication that um, we, the space that's necessary to make sure that we have strong programs and that the growing population that's happening. So next year alone, um, we have had to make some additional classroom changes because of a variety of reasons, but most notably that um, we've seen an increase in some of the populations of, of students with disabilities in these areas, but also we're trying to address some equity issues that could potentially lead to a, a civil rights issue if we do not address them properly, and that we want to make sure that special education students have the same equitable square footage and amenities as our regular education students do. So next year, um, we've had to add an additional language learning disabled classroom at Eaton, which is now called the Bridge Program. The Bridge Program, <laughs> thank you. An additional Compass classroom, yep. did I get it right? Yeah, you got it. Uh, at Birch Meadow, and that's because of the growing population of, of, that, of that student. Um, okay, I draw a Compass. Compass. Compass, oh, that's Wood a Compass yeah. also, okay. Compass Program at Wood End, um, and do we? And it's going to be TSP. Oh, TSP, right, thank you. Support. I'm going to learn these, yeah. these new uh, um, classroom at, at Killam. So those are additional classrooms that we've had to um, put in place. Now, just to make it clear in full transparency, where did these classrooms come from? There are two things that are al allowing this space to become available. One is we have seen a decrease in our kindergarten population for next year. Um, which has freed up a classroom or two in the district. And the second, and this is at Killam, because we made the reductions of the two elementary teachers, there was classroom space available there, which allowed us to um, have a, a classroom at, at, at Killam uh, for the SSP. Um, so, you know, obviously we're looking, we, we, we have to treat this as a year by year situation. Um, but space is definitely a, a concern for special education programs, full day kindergarten, preschool, um, and other program offerings. Also, what I, I think is important to keep on the radar uh, for the community is Killam. Um, Killam is the only school that has not had any renovation done to it. It was built in 1969. We have made uh, structural changes to it over the years. Uh, roof, um, some windows, um, some other things, um, but we have to keep an eye on that at some point some work is going to be done, have to be done with Killam, um, and that's probably going to have to happen sooner than later. MSBA is going to be coming through and doing a complete analysis of all school buildings again throughout the Commonwealth um, this fall like they did several years ago, and we'll be giving ratings to each of the schools which will determine where they would fall on um, the MSBA list if, if a community was to move forward. So once we get that information, we'll have a better understanding of where Killam lies. Um, <clears throat> and then the last piece, which I really think is connected to the, all the other ones, is staying competitive with our area schools. And when I mean area schools, I'm talking about other districts in terms of making sure that we are competitive to retain and attract staff um, with charter schools, with private schools, to make sure that we have the best programs possible, the best curriculum, um, our, our teachers that are uh, trained and um, able to, to work with students. We want to make sure that we have um, those in place. Those other areas help us remain competitive with area schools. And I don't think that's a point that we should take lightly um, in, that, in that there are a lot of different offerings out there and we want to make sure that we, we keep our students uh, in, our, in our school district. So breaking this down, and again, you know, we, we, we look at these 
numbers the best we can at this point, given uh, we're looking at a budget that doesn't start till July 1 um, of 2017. Sorry. FY18. Yeah. FY18. Um, but this is approximately the, the cost that we're looking at to do what we were talking about um, earlier. So the structural deficit, which is the $2 million that I mentioned earlier, um, I also have the challenges that it addresses, which are located at the bottom, and the district goal that it connects to. Um, the retaining and attracting of staff. Um, has, has, it has that cost to it. The elementary teachers and the paraeducators for Wednesdays, um, you can see the cost of, of putting that Wednesday back in as a full day of school. Um, the middle school curriculum piece, um, the high school teacher piece, um, the additional supports, um, the school transformation grant funded positions, uh, the this, this curriculum supervision leadership, um, which would could look uh, at a variety of ways and I there's different models that we could look at so that's why I think it's better to look at an amount of funding and have further conversation of what that would look like um, but it would definitely be focused on two things making sure that we have a, a curriculum implementation K to 12 and also that this, there's supervision working with teachers and it has evaluated evaluation responsibilities um, and as I said before, a lot of districts, there's different models in each district. I think we have to find the one that works best for Reading um, and use some of the things that we already have in place and perhaps restructure some of those. And then special education leadership is what I talked about earlier and then the additional clerical support. Um, so that is really what, you know, in the conversations that we've been having over the last year plus would be what it would take to move forward to deal with the structural deficit that we've talked about plus moving forward. And I think that's, oh, I'm sorry, there was one other slide. And then secondary, not, not, not secondary, but just as important, but perhaps looking at it as a longer term challenge is what are we going to do with full day kindergarten and the space that's gonna be needed to renovate Killam, I mean the funding needed to renovate Killam and provide additional program space. Um, so the, these two slides, I think, capture a summary of what we've been discussing for the last several months. I, I just wanted to um, go back to the slide on supporting teachers and administrators, because I think that this is really important. As you were talking, I was realizing that um, I was adding up we were, we've been talking about um, sort of L, uh, curriculum leadership and um, uh, you know the, the support since my oldest sons were in third grade and they are, they are they completed their fourth year of college so that's 13 years that sort of we've been talking about making sure that we have the curriculum coaching specialist sort of that supervision um, and I think it's really it, it, it's just critical. We can, I don't feel like uh, we can really deliver the outcomes that we expect if we can't properly support the, the teachers with the coaching, the mentoring, again, the uh, private industry, the basically the performance review. You need to be able to do that well. And I don't, I don't know of, of really anyone. There's a very few people in where I work, 1,300 people, where somebody would have 30, 40, 50 uh, reports to do performance review and coaching and be responsible for ensuring that that person is gonna be successful. And um, those, those groups are uh, their manufacturing people, not a teacher who is in front of students, 100 students every day across the day, and they get that one year, that one time to deliver a curriculum that's going to challenge them, inspire them, and move them forward, and let them achieve the best that they can achieve. So, if we if we think that we can do this with our administrators having 40 to 60 people, that's why we're we're not making the gains that we should. And I don't want anyone to construe this as it's negative. No, performance management is a it's a it's a positive thing. It's it enables you identify where somebody is strong and they should be 
held up and shared like we do Blue Ribbon or where somebody <coughs> needs additional support and you provide that. And, I, and that thread runs through all of this, I think. And, and you know, when we talk about um, retaining and attracting staff, it's not just about the dollars, it's about the working conditions. And I think we've had some good people burned up and burned out and um, we're, if we're in jeopardy of that as we go through the next year if we don't put something in place that's gonna kind of um, turn that ship around. So. What I find compelling about that those um, the <coughs> curriculum leadership positions is the matter of equity. I mean, if you have five elementary schools, how do you ensure that second grade at this elementary school this uh, looks the same? And how do you ensure that at two large, we have a, the average school district in Massachusetts is low 2000s, right? I feel like it is. Uh, I think so. It, we're a little bit higher than we're, the average. We're a, yeah. we're a large district with a lot of kids and a lot of schools. Without these positions, how do you ensure mm -hmm. that, that there's equitable um, access to the curriculum across the board? So I think there's an, also an equity argument to be made. Just to <coughs> add to that, um, so since I retired from the Danish Public Schools, I've probably worked with closely to 20 different school districts in this general area. We know of at least probably 20 more. Uh, maybe that's an exaggeration, maybe just 10 more. And without doubt, we have the fewest um, positions that have anything to do with supervision or curriculum leadership. Um, it's really put on the teachers, and you know, it really, to me, it's, it, you know, teacher leaders are a great thing, but when I was in Danvis, there was teacher leaders, but I led the teacher leaders. You really don't have anybody that can do that unless you ask a principal to do it, in which case their work responsibility in their own building is being affected. So I agree with what has been said. You know, those are, it's, it's a critical area, and like you said, it, it pretty much runs through as a thread through pretty much all of the, you know, the needs that we have. So I just wanted to, before we get, get on I guess selling the new things, which is what I think you're both. I, I wanted to go back to the structural deficit because uh, that's where we have to start. Mm -hmm. uh, and I guess my question is on the retaining and attracting staff. Now, you know, obviously I got to be careful with what I say because right. we're, we're, you know, we don't want to talk about contractual things, but wouldn't some of that be in the structural deficit already? It is. So that's in addition to what you've put into the two, that $260,000 figure that you have on above the line? I'll, I'll say it's, all that stuff is above the it's line. It's above, yeah. It's above and beyond the structural deficit, all of those numbers. Okay. I can jump in. You've, I'm glad you've brought us in that direction. Yeah. Um, that we really should spend a couple. I think we've been immersed in it now for so many weeks that we're. It's worth saying that that structural deficit is a serious, serious, serious problem, and we're looking at a two million dollar cut. And we understand that that is absolutely going to be staff. That is absolutely going to impact students. That will absolutely mean larger class sizes and fewer programs. I don't think we've gone the next step. It's a, and then what happens in FY19? We're not gonna have fewer kids to educate. There won't be less work to do. Mm -hmm. So now you've made that horrible, that you've done the best you can, but it's going to be very impactful. What does that do to attrition of employees? I, I, I think that question answers itself. That's what I'm really, really concerned about is not only the FY18, mm -hmm. but what that looks like at FY19 and FY20. And you dig that hole deep enough, at some point, the community will come in and solve it, I believe. Um, but solving it in those future years is, you've, you've gone down a really bad place. And you don't fix that problem in a year when you've started just to burn, to burn staff out and mm -hmm. to have class sizes <coughs> become too large and to you know, cut programs. Now, will you wonder, now you can reinstitute the program maybe in three or four years, you're starting from scratch. So I think the, the impact um, is truly scary. Oh, um, I'm going to let the com committee, but then, but keep bugging me if I don't see you. <laughs> I just want to raise the uh, point that it's, you know, what you're talking about is, you know, that's the um, FY18, 
and then I can't even wrap my mind around what FY19 would look like, but I just want to say, when you get, when you're at that place where, what was the number, John, 300,000 of that possibly could come out of expenses? Oh, you know, yes, right? the re it's, yeah. So, um, there's also, you know, it, it's a huge morale issue, and the last time that, you know, 13 years ago, uh, you know, there was, I, it is, it is, right, it is, it was the third grade, you know, literally, there were 29 kids in my son's third grade classes, and at the time, you know, Re uh, Reading wasn't actually the only district going through some difficult times, I know, in Andover, they had also been going through difficult times, and it just does so much damage to um, the morale and the relationship, really, between sort of the, the, the school committee and the, um, the, the teachers, um, and you create situations that take years and years and years to repair. So I, you know, the, the first and foremost, we, we have to make sure that we uh, address, you know, address that. And then if the community, and if we want, the community wants the school district that I think we're, we're trying to outline that we, we feel this community deserves, the students deserve, then the other pieces of it are incredibly important and I think, you know, very well thought through. Yeah, I, I, I don't disagree with that at all. I guess, but my, <coughs> I guess my point is we're, and I don't mean to oversimplify it, but we're, we're looking at a, a $2 million structural deficit, which we know, and we're asking, we're looking to add 10 more things on top of that. So our discussion really needs to be, uh, we need to, we need to sell the community on, on definitely on the 2 million and then, uh, you know, whatever else on, on top of that, that is absolutely necessary for next year. And I just don't see how it can be. Ten additional line items. I, I don't. I don't think you can pick these apart, though. One line. The way the way that we've laid them out, I think one line item at a at a time. And I don't think. And this isn't for. This additional isn't for next year. This is for. This is a, the view that says, this community, ha addresses overrides for whatever reason at a frequency that is generally longer than other communities. So. 10 or 13 years and you know we if we if we go and we say we've got the structural deficit and that's what we want to address and we absolutely need to address because it's um, the, the we will do considerable damage if we don't address that but I, I think you know it's not the community is not the kind of community that you're gonna go back to next year and say okay well now we these are the things that we want to do to, to take the district forward. And I think some of the things that are on this list, the, the school transformation grant, those two positions, those are, those are we're relying on the, those. Those are essential, essential. We're asking teachers and administrators to make incredibly high quality and efficient decisions about students and student outcomes. They can't do it if they have to crunch data and the data's not information. So when, you know, when I look at that, it, it, and and the, the special education pieces of it, the clerical support, we've been talking a lot about the team chairs, about the burden on Carolyn, we heard earlier uh, sometime this year, how much time you spent evaluating bus routes or busing or bus data or bus videos, and uh, you're not doing your job leading the team chairs and you know leading special education. So the fact that you got the post program in there, I'm like, I'm totally amazed that we got that done this year. So. I, you know, I don't, I don't see it as, I don't really for myself see it as um, an either or. I don't, I don't see, I do see the next page as long term as something that we need to really look at how will the community address this. Because tuition fee free full day K is, um, you know, would require um, backfilling the revenue so these things, I think, are, you know, more discussion. I wouldn't think that it's something that we would be putting into, you know, putting in front of the community in a financial way right now. I, get, 
can I? Yeah, go ahead. So, mm -hmm. you know, I guess to your comment that the, this community, it's not the community's fault because uh, we haven't asked the community. It's, uh, it's the leadership in the town that hasn't asked the community for an override. So the fact that we haven't had one for 10 years has nothing to do with the community. Mm -hmm. It has to do with uh, elected officials and staff who haven't asked mm -hmm. for one every year. So, uh, and uh, so, you know, that's up to us to, and we haven't. Uh, mm -hmm. But, uh, and I'm not saying that, uh, you know, there aren't some of those things that uh, I'm just, my, my point is we, we also have to be realistic in what we can sell too. And uh, I kind of thought what we talked about on Saturday was to, uh, you know, take this list and prioritize it. And I, and I respect if you think all of those are priority, then that's all, that's the only, that's where I was going with that is mm -hmm. my priority right now is $2 million. And then to listen to discussion tonight and hear from the superintendent as to, you know, what, what else on top of that. Um, I, I actually agree with both of you. I would very much, I see the value in all of these things. So I want to do them all, but I agree with, with Mr. Robinson. My fear is if you lump them all together, at some point, do you risk the community saying no? And you don't get the $2 million that you desperately need because you've over asked. And that's, uh, that's just threading that needle, I think is gonna be very hard. That's the challenge. <laughs> I think part of what I, I agree with most of what's been said because I think that these are not the things that are on the quote cutting room floor. This is not the Mandarin Chinese that we're not offering or the strings or the there are a lot of things that aren't up there that would make this an even better school system. But I think that we also have to think about and help the community understand the cost of not doing these things. So when teachers don't stay, and then we need to get teachers at what we can afford, then we're talking about potentially not getting the quality teachers that we're accustomed to, and them not having the support, the mentoring um, that our teachers are accustomed to getting when they come into our district so they can get up to speed. Well, that's, that costs money too. That costs time, that costs money, that costs energy. The, the burnout factor that's been discussed <coughs> is really important when teachers are spinning their wheels and administration is spinning their wheels just trying to put out fires and not doing what their passion is, which is helping the kids, which is what our ultimate goal is in the schools. I think I understand that there are real challenges in our community. I also think that understanding what these things mean, both in terms of, not only in terms of what they are costing, but what they will cost if we don't do them. I mean, lawsuits that come because we're not reaching the bar for civil rights equity space, where we're trying to restructure to make do when that that compromise, it doesn't compromise, but it doesn't maximize the services that we are supposed to be serving. I think that there are costs in not doing these things too, and we've been cutting year after year after year. And at this point, we need to look forward for the next 13 years, potentially, because that's what it took to come to this place again. Um, and we need to be really clear, and I'm grateful for the support that we're getting in trying to educate the community, the listening sessions that the selectmen have had so that we could hear people's concerns. I think that this, I, I don't think this is extra. I think that this is not the cutting room floor. I think this is what we need to do. Um, Dr. Doherty, did you wanna jump in? I, um, yeah, I just, I don't see this as the only night you're going to be discussing this. I mean, as you took the words out of my mouth. As, <laughs> as you um, as you saw in your calendar, there's actually three times in July that we know of right now that you're going to be meeting. 
I would recommend that you, you know, not get in the exercise of prioritizing tonight, but that you've seen this now, uh, this a second time, and that when um, the next time we meet or the time after that, depending on how the, we do the interview process for the director of finance, that, that this is a continuing discussion. And if there are things that you would like us to do, um, in the meantime, we can certainly do that. Um, you know, if we're looking, if, if the committee wants to look at a priority, I would think that I would like to go back and have conversations with building principals and central office administrators as well, because yeah. I think that would be important. Yeah. Could I yeah. add a couple of things? I mean, I also think it's important to remember, and I, th I think you alluded to it, um, that this sort of is a priority list. It's not a wish list, but if many other things that could be put on it that have already been called from the list, right. programs that we haven't been able to offer, other sorts of things, we could look at um, comparable communities that have different positions and things, and we could start picking those. But that's not what this list is. Um, I mean, we could pick any number of those things. We uh, Earlier tonight, we talked about the importance of health programs and how that's missing, um, the importance of not being able to attract and retain staff, staff the way we want to. If we wanted to restructure Wednesdays um, to get us up with the leadership, I mean, I don't, the way that's framed in my mind is not an an additional or extra extra position, but really, you know, we looked at it from the lens of how do we make sure our fiscal responsibility that we fiscally most efficient or responsible way to ensure we're getting the maximum output, maximum capacity from the staffing that we're able to have. Um, and that's what that, that's how that's framed in my mind. You know, the teacher leadership has been absolutely wonderful. I would never want to lose that, but one of the things that we, they actually, discovered um, through their PLC work is the inconsistencies and things that are there. Mm -hmm. And you can only fix that through some different structures and some leadership. We're never going to have all the positions that some of the listed have, and nor do we are we even ask for those. But there are there's a small number of positions and structures that can act, actually maximize capacity in a way that I think is what the community would like. It'd be very different. And that's how I frame that in my mind. Not just additional things like very thoughtful. Thank you. Well, I agree with, uh, with Dr. Doherty. You had a question? Yeah, you so, yeah. well, a couple things. Uh, you mentioned what else would we want to see. Uh, you threw that out. So I'd be interested to, you know, to, to Linda's point, I'd like to know, uh, if you can, uh, what uh, know and I don't think it applies to all categories but it probably does maybe the special education what what potential costs could be associated with not doing you know what my question so the mm -hmm. uh, lawsuits or whatever uh, I know you can't by not doing what I by not doing any of those or like one or one or, or one one or all is there a cost associated with doing some you could say for each one of them, if you don't do each one of them, it's going to cost us more, or there's a few of them. I just would be like, does that make sense? What I, I think so, yes. Uh, and, you know, I don't, you know, I, I guess I, we'll, we're going to talk about this more, but I don't want to come, a, uh, I still feel like, you know, we know that the structural deficit's two million dollars. Did and I, I can't remember. Did the town manager, when we came up with that number, talk about using any level of free cash in FY18? I believe this is using, I believe this is using two million dollars in free All cash right, so, to get to the point seven percent. I so, think. So, so my, so then my. <laughs> So if we were to do all of these things, we theoret and if we didn't have it all right, we still ask for all these, we'd be using an unprecedented amount of free cash, Craig. So I don't know how we can sit here and say that some of those things wouldn't be, I, I'm just it open, you know, that some of those things wouldn't be extra or, you know, uh, 
we need to talk about that further, I guess. You know. And um, I will take a couple more comments, but Dr. Doherty's right. We will be discussing this at every meeting yeah. now going forward. So it's, but um, let's wrap it up. This right. is really Just quickly, Chuck, to <coughs> back up what you're saying, I, I completely understand, but I think the one thing that I, the community wants to know what we're going to spend it on. Yeah. You need, you mm -hmm. want, you want more money, you have to itemize it. So this is what we've done here. Mm -hmm. And then, then, you know, then the discussion goes, but I think we had to do this exercise to say, well, we, we have to take care of the structural deficit, but now what else really just to, to, you know, to keep us in the scope and to keep us up with our peer communities, you know, and then, and maybe there is another list that is the cutting room floor to <coughs> say, you know what, these are all the other things we considered, but we haven't asked for them and, and that might help too. Mm -hmm. Good point. Um, a piece of information I asked Dr. Doherty for, and I know it's virtually impossible to get other than back of the envelope, is we know that our per pupil compared to our peer communities is very, very low. What happens if you add $2 million to our budget, to that per pupil? And then what happens if you add four? Mm -hmm. I did it using Martha's budget book myself. It, it's surprising, but not a huge impact. I don't think it has. So that's another compelling piece of information. Mm -hmm. We're not going to go with $2 million or $4 million. We're not going to go from a, you know, a a very very low per people school to a very high. We're gonna increment. We're gonna, we might we'll not bump be, us up a we couple. We might not be the yeah. lowest anymore, um, and I think the community needs to understand that too because it puts it in context a little. So I I just want to echo that I think the two things that um, Ms. Robinson just asked for you know is is there a cost of not doing this and then Julie you asked for you know the cutting room floor some of the things that Linda was alluding to, so I think that would be good because we specifically have s tried to talk about things that we believe we need to attain the student outcomes that the students deserve, right? So we, these are needs, not wants. Um, and, it, and it still means that there's other districts, pu public districts, that are doing things we still wish that we could do, but we might not. But I just wanna, um, so, because Mr. Robinson, you were talking about FY18, so when I think about, um, you know, for what do we need to get through FY18, the structural n number is definitely, <coughs> that's without a doubt, but, but I think when we go, if we're talking about going for, to the community for that override, we need to be looking at, you know, all of these other needs. So, you know, I, it's in my mind, I guess in my mind, I'm just, I, I, I stopped a while ago thinking about sort of just, just FY18 and getting through. And maybe that's, maybe that's wrong because I'm taking some things for granted about um, the community. But I, I look at that and I say, you know, we, we need to be thinking, you know, beyond that when we're thinking about the, a, a number or a, or we're coming to the community for this is what we need for an on an override basis to make this district what it needs to be. So I think I have you know, maybe stepped too far and so more discussion. Yeah, and I think it's Eight important to, to recognize too that this isn't gonna be a decision that this committee makes. We're gonna make a recommendation and the Board of Selectmen will do with that decision what they want and then there's gonna be a town meeting and they're gonna do what they want and then the voters are ultimately going to decide. So the best we can do is advise and, and clearly defend and, ar and articulate the need um, but there's a lot of, a lot of, a long way to go. Oh, yes, you're right. So I, I like the way Joyce presented her thoughts on it. Um, in, in Chuck, to of course, it's you know the two hundred, the two two million is just absolutely critical. But I want to go back to what our response. What, what are we charged with? What is our responsibility? It's not just supervising the superintendent. It's student achievement, and if some of those items up there. I don't think you can really quantify, you know, how much it's going to cost us monetarily. It, there's a lot of qualitative uh, considerations that need to be made too. And, and again, though, I'm fully aware that, you know, 200, excuse me, two million dollars is a lot of money. And you know, the additional 1.85 is, you know, certainly people are going to look at it, and we've got to be able to. Lane said, you know, we, we have to be able to, and, and Chuck said it too, actually, you know, we've got to be able to explain why, why it's beneficial and why we need it. Should we continue? Um, 
I only <coughs> want to make one more comment about process. Um, obviously, while we're doing this, the Board of Selectmen are doing the town half of the budget. Um, and so I know Dr. Doherty is in regular contact with the town manager, um, and he and I and, and Mr. Robinson have certainly been working to make sure we're coordinating. And that's going to continue. I think it's kind of an iterative process. We have our meeting, they have their meeting, then we discuss where we're at. So we're just kind of moving forward, but we haven't lost track of them and being in contact with the town side. Um, <coughs> oh, sorry, Miss Ambie. I have a question. Um, I knew you were informed, so that's why I'm asking. It was my understanding that the school committee is charged with the fiduciary responsibility of the school budget. So I guess my confusion is the board of selectmen gets to decide whether or not what you ask for and why you ask for it, they get to pass judgment on that? That is my understanding, and I'm going to turn to more experienced folks in the room, is that it is the purview of the Board of Selectmen to determine whether or not an override goes on the ballot and what the amount is and for what purpose. I think is my nice understanding. The Board of Selectmen at some of these meetings notice quite an outcome. Um, well, we're, we are talking to them. We'll continue to. Mr. Paul. I'm trying to wrap my head around the idea of 30 FTD cuts if we don't get the structural deficit. Like, well, that's about what four teachers per school mm -hmm. I think it probably I, I don't know can you do the middle school model that we're using at the middle schools with taking four FTEs out I and then you know I mean maybe this is you yeah I don't want to get into the specificity of the cuts I just did a straight mathematical middle. problem yeah. but as right. I said at the beginning it most likely won't be all teacher cuts there will be support staff cuts there will be administrative cuts um, to get to that uh, reduction Are you looking at potentially removing one, one teacher in each of the grades? And so where you had three classrooms of 24 to 26, you're now looking at two classrooms of 36 to 39 students. Yeah. I'm trying to wrap my head around. It, it is going to have an impact on class size and programs. I mean, you know, sort of in the general sense, higher class sizes is one thing to say, okay, we're, we're taking the class sizes and increasing them by 50% yeah. um, at the elementary three to five level. Yeah. That, and that's, to, to, I think, reiterate what Dr. Doherty was saying is we're trying to find the balance between clearly articulating to the community what the reality here is and how serious it is, but also not create a massive morale problem by, by going down the road of what will we do if and where will we um, make those hard decisions because um, you don't want to create that kind of environment in the schools in September where people are now starting to do that brainstorming of, well, what's it going to be? So, I, you know. As he said, 30 FTEU is a really rough back of the envelope. It won't all be teaching positions. There will be administrative positions. And I, um, I'm going to ask if anyone on the committee disagrees with me. I don't think we're going to go down that road until we have to. We'll start the FY18 budget in the November and December time frame when we have an answer from the community. Hopefully, we'll never have to go down that road. Hopefully, we'll never have to answer that question. Um, but I think the time to answer that question and have that discussion is November, when we have to, if we have to. Do you know what I'm saying? As opposed what to, I'm saying in terms of informing the selection to say larger class sizes, you know, what does that really mean? You know, what could that really mean? Okay. So, and, yeah. yeah. And, you know, to, to other points, I, I agree with, you know, if we're not going to have enough, if we might not see another override for 10 years, you know, but we would not address the, the Wednesday, you know, and everybody gets on their, like, oh, the, you know, roving bands of kids, you know, or what do, we, what do the parents do, you know, on those Wednesdays for supervision? Um, or not having health when we've seen all of this, um, you know, the, the, I've seen, you know, <coughs> Eric and Hector came to the, the Coolidge PTO and showed all of these samples of things that are, it clearly targeted to kids, um, you know, that, that we need to make sure that those kids are being informed. Um, those are kind I of the qualitative costs that Mr. Nye yeah. was talking about. You can't put the dollar sign on it, but it's mm -hmm. a cost, it's a huge cost. Thank you. Dr. Um, I just wanted to, um, recognize what Mr. Cochran was saying because I think that we heard loud and clear from the listening sessions that people don't feel qualified to, to suggest what services they can do without. They're looking to us to say what they will be doing without if we don't have this override. And so what I'm hearing Mr. Cochran say is part, and I recognize the challenge with the staff but to the best of our abilities without creating the tsunami of panic um, that, that articulating as we're trying to do what the damage will be, uh, what the concrete 
expectations would be should we not have this influx refill of um, funding I think that we need we need to art keep articulating that and I think articulating <coughs> I don't mean to trap but beyond FY18 I think is compelling too so you don't just say the 30 FTEs you say the people who are left are now teaching are teaching the, doing the exact same amount of work with but it's much harder and it's much more and there's much less support. So then you create a, a very dangerous cycle. So that's a way to articulate it that isn't. Can I just, I know that we want to yeah, move on. Do, my, my one more thing that I keep wanting to say is the bandwidth issue. As our teachers get more and more on their plate, as the funding gets tighter and tighter, if we do over time, over the years, cut back on staff and cut back on resources, we're actually, that's, um, exponential in some ways because the teachers and the administration who have been seeking out grants and who have been bringing money into the town that um, doesn't cost the town any money they no longer have that bandwidth to do that work and to supervise those grants and so in a way it's we lose even more money because we would have had grants coming in because people had the bandwidth to research them and then follow through and then supervise them. Yeah. So, thank you. All right, to be determined, to be continued on that topic for the next several weeks. Um, Dr. Doherty, do you want to talk us through your evaluation process? Part two. <laughs> Part two. Um, so, I have put in a revised memo in the packet related to the, <coughs> the timeline and the process. Um, given the fact that there's an awful lot going on, which we all know, I changed the timeline so that the evaluation would be done for the August meeting, it, um, which is actually the where it's been done the last two years. <laughs> so. <laughs> I, I just figured with everything else going on, I just don't think that the committee's going to have time to do it in July. You are very patient with us. I, I, <laughs> yeah. But I have given you now all the tools that you need yes. <laughs> to, um, uh, to do the evaluation. Um, and so I've, I've sent, you know, I've given you the, the Dropbox that has basically all of the evidence that is public information that has been used all year long in different presentations. Um, I did add a couple more things today um, that relate to data. So um, you have that information and in there also is the rubric that you'll be using the, uh, the yeah, the rubric yeah. that you'll be using, um, which I, is it, is Mrs. Webb going to be the one that's going to be collecting? I don't think we discussed that I did. Yet. She's been nice enough to do it I for the last several years. I, I actually had offered to the previous chair you, oh, okay. to <laughs> say that I would do that if no one else came forward with an adi a burning desire. Oh. <laughs> okay. So, well, thank you. Um, Dr. Doherty, I'm looking for the calendar in here. Uh, you, you had said... Thank you very much. I think it's towards the back. I know I saw it. It's. I'm looking for the actual like layout of what you the need. Timeline. Right? Oh, the timeline. So four. it's on page four of the actual memo. Yeah. Sorry. Oh, right four of the actual. Um, Thank you very so, much. So so tonight I'm giving you the overview with the evidence um, from June 28th to July 8th. Um, each school committee member would complete a draft copy of the rubric. Um, and then send it to um, Mrs. Webb and myself. And then from the 8th to the 18th, uh, which we've done in previous years, I would meet with each um, individual school committee member to discuss the draft. Yep. Um, and then based on the conversations, the school committee member may revise it. Um, and then by the 25th, the, Mrs. Webb would receive all final individual summative evaluations and then she would compile them and create an end of the cycle summative evaluation report, which would then be presented um, in, at the August 29th school committee meeting. So the most immediate deadline right now for us is July 8th. Correct. Get that form Correct. in by July 8th. Thank you. Okay, and I, 
I, I, it is the chair's responsibility, so I definitely don't. Um, oh, you nope. talk about no, offline, no, no. but if you want, nope. if, if that discussion already <laughs> happened, <laughs> then I will, I will thank you, you, want, you for your service. <laughs> no, I'm just saying. No. Um, Shall we talk about the revised school year calendar? Yes, I was that was that in the evaluation? Yeah, that was it. I just want to make sure everyone had the tools they needed to move July forward. July 8th, though. That's what everyone <laughs> needs to remember. <laughs> you all have homework. And there's no big holiday that everybody's taking off between now <laughs> no, and No, 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 no. I won't be doing mine under fireworks. Uh, Mr. Robinson. Madam Chair, move to approve the revised 2016-17 school year calendar as presented. Thank you. Um, do I have a second? Second. Dr. Doherty, can you talk us through the... Yes. Uh, there's only one proposed change, right? There, there is one proposed change, and, and a lot of this came th from the work of the Professional Development Committee um, through the survey that was done, um, which actually is part of the evidence that's in, in the information that was given to you. Um, so there was a lot of this, and maybe Craig can add to this too because he was part of those conversations, but um, there was a lot of conversation about moving the April um, in service day, which has traditionally been that Friday before April vacation, uh, permanently to more in the March time frame. Um, March, as we know, is a long month to begin with. Um, by moving this professional development, which is essentially blue ribbon, moving that experience to, um, to the March time frame, um, breaks up the month of March, but also provides um, more opportunity for the staff to be able to take what they've learned at the conference and um, implement in their classes uh, the, the rest of the school year. Um, in the calendar, you can see what we've uh, proposed is to move it to March, where is it? 24, thank you. Oh yeah, it just, it didn't shave. Um, to March 24th. Um, right now, in the calendar that you approved in the fall, it was um, April 14th. April 14th would still be a half day um, and not it wouldn't be a full day but it would be a half day for for students it would be a full day for teachers which would be professional development time for them on the 14th on still? the 14th yes. should I get just a little back yes allocation? yes so essentially for a number of years as you know we've had the Thursday the, uh, prior to sp mm -hmm. spring break at 11 o'clock dismissal then gave staff an in-service afternoon. Um, and then the following Friday, right before spring break, a full day in-service. And we had done um, what people have called our Blue Ribbon Institute over those days. This year, we felt was very successful doing a one-day model for the institute. Still felt we got the full um, impact and positive benefits from that. Um, we were able to provide in-service training, professional development op opportunities for our district on the Thursday afternoon. So then the question then that was obviously raised, well, we certainly, those are two very valuable times, that afternoon and that full day, but going with the one-day model for the Institute, do those two days have to be together? Mm -hmm. And the answer obviously was no. And if they separated them, what would be the best way to do that? We felt that um, moving the full day to March there are, usually aren't other things that break up March in a way. Um, moving the uh, moving it out of April also sort of might create some pot um, potential benefit to that week of April. Um, just having the, the final 11 o'clock dismissal on a Friday, especially at the elementary level where Wednesday is an early release and then Thursday early release and Friday off, we kind of would buy s perhaps some better time there in that week of April before break. So it seemed like a win-win, at least to try it out, and we'll see how it goes. The, the one other piece that I want to add, which isn't really connected to the calendar, but has been connected to Blue Ribbon, is that ArtsFest would pretty much stay in the April time frame. Mm -hmm. This year, because of the religious holidays, we are doing ArtsFest a week earlier. We usually do it the week leading to April vacation this week. This year, because um, Passover is that week, we're moving it to the week before. <laughs> um, so it's kind of related to the calendar, but I just wanted also to communicate that we're not connecting Blue Ribbon and Arts Fest anymore. So it's Arts going to be separated. Arts Fest will be the week of the third. Um, yes, I believe so. Yes. Yeah, the first week in April. Oh, 
I was just, I like the idea of moving it to March. I think that that, it, it, that it's just better continuity in the school calendar. I like that, and I think everybody needs a break in March. Yeah. Um, I tried to do this <laughs> before when we talked about it, and so, and I, I don't think I t articulated it well, but <coughs> April 14th is Good Friday, and I know that we just changed and we're, we took out the religious holidays. I still feel like there could be a little um, uh, perception. perception in the community that we're still, we, I know that's how the calendar falls, but it is Good Friday, and for all intents and purposes, it's a day off because you get out at 11 o'clock. So I just, I want to, us to be a little bit, you know, aware of, of this calendar year, but I still think it, there's a sensitivity there. And we did talk about that. I mean, it just, it is just happened to be this, this right. year. In the previous version, of course, it was a full in service day. Right. So kids would actually, yeah, yeah. And so if anything is showing we're actually not making any changes based on the fact that it just happens to fall on that day. But you're right. I mean, it's, it's there. It's a, it's a reality. Um, but essentially now will be a half day of school where before it was not, but it really didn't play into the <coughs> No, but decision I to move it. But right, it but I wasn't, I wasn't comfortable there. with it when we talked about it in the fall. You know, so I just wanted to say it out loud. It'd That's be interesting all. to look at um, yeah. 2018 and see when it Good Friday falls, because hopefully it's, it it's, it's probably if, if it resolves itself, I haven't looked at the calendar, but that would be a good response, right. is it yeah, happened to be. It gets moved so. around. It, good Friday moves. It has to do with the the, the full moon, and right. yeah. it's, yeah, it's, it, but it, it can Mr. be as Martin early said. as March 20th. Good Friday can be as early as March 20th. As Mr. Martin said, it didn't play into our decision making at all. No. I think, too, that it's important that we as school committee members take the whole context. The fact that the first Seder is on the 10th of April and the Arts Fest was moved to accommodate that is all part of that accommodation policy. So Good Friday isn't off because it's a holiday, but there was the accommodation, the no event day on the 10th and the 11th to be respectful of that too. So it's not like one happens in isolation. It's trying to be accommodating too. So I, I, I think that there's sort of, there is still that package there of respect that's happening Good. in the whole picture. Okay. Any other questions or comments on the calendar? <coughs> Are we ready for a vote? Mm -hmm. All right, all in favor of the proposed change at 6-0. Oh, it is 10 o'clock. Um, yeah, that's a good idea. I think that's good. It's yeah. just the calendar and the reports. For so let's, the calendar, our next meeting is, let's see, July 18th. July 18th. Is that correct? I'm sorry? Our next meeting is July 18th. That's the that interviews, right? Yes, July, July 18th. Okay. Yes. And we'll continue offline. Um, and then you have a meeting the 20th and the 25th. So we get a little bit of a break, but then three meetings right away. Right. Um, I would propose putting off reports until our next meeting, unless anyone here has something that is very, very time sensitive. I do not. I do not. I do not. Um, I, I do have one thought. I should have mentioned it when we were on the agenda item about the finance director. Um, Mrs. Joyce is our representative on that search committee, and mm -hmm. they will be developing questions in two days. Yes. Yep. So if anyone on this committee has a thought about a quality they would look for in a finance director, a question they would like asked, or an, an area they want to explore, um, an email to Mrs. Joyce copying myself and Dr. Doherty would keep us well within the purview of open meeting law, um, but would give her some valuable. That's a great idea. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. But but do it by Wednesday. You've got like 24 hours. Think about it. <laughs> <and> <laughs> Wednesday morning. Um, but that one is a little time sensitive. It's very time sensitive. Yeah. Any other reports that really can't wait? In two lines, without a whole, um, it's just that the Human Relations Advisory Committee has added an additional meeting this month. So June 30th and July 7th will both be Human Relations Advisory Committee at the police station in the con in the conference room, in the community room. Sorry, at seven. Thank you. Thank you. Anything else from the committee? Anything from no. staff? At ten o'clock at night. Oh, yeah. Kitchen to, to tell us. Okay. Yeah. All right. So that's it for this. Um, we are headed into executive session. So I'll take a motion. Uh, Madam Chair, move to 
enter into executive session to discuss strategy with respect to litigation and school safety and security, the approval of minutes, and not to return to open session. Second? I second. Uh, roll call vote. Mr. Knight? Yes. 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 We are adjourned. No, we're into executive session. Yes, this is the order. Sorry.